This is the Mahabharata Podcast, episode 61, War is Hell. Last time, we finished the Bhagavad Gita. Arjun had become weak in the knees over the prospect of killing his elders and kinfolk, so Krishna had to set him straight and get his friend back into the fight. Arjun specifically needed to reconcile the conflict between carrying out his dharma when his dharma required him to commit atrocities. This problem was Krishna's starting point. He addressed it by saying it's better to do one's own dharma badly than to do another's well. Secondly, he said, never mind the bloodshed, since no one really dies. From there, he launched into a discussion of the unreality of this existence. More practically, Krishna pointed out that Arjun really had few alternatives to fighting, because no matter what excuse he used for not fighting, he would suffer dishonor and ignominy if he retreated. I'm not sure how one can argue that the world is unreal and then discourage you by threatening that others will make fun of you. The subtle question that is not directly answered is, how does one even know what their true dharma is? What if Arjun's dharma was to become a pacifist at this moment and to endure the disgrace as a protest to the world's violence? For those of us who do not have Krishna in the driver's seat, how would we know whether our dharma was to fight or to run away? Perhaps the question is even more urgent in this modern age. After all, Arjun was born to fight, so you could easily imagine his dharma had something to do with fighting. In our times, we have no such certainty in life. We cherish our freedom, but then we lack any guidelines to help us chart the direction of our lives. But although Krishna does not address this question directly, I think we can find a subtle answer if we look carefully. I believe what Krishna is telling us is that he is indeed in the driver's seat for every one of us. Arjun was fortunate in that Krishna was literally driving his chariot. But Krishna's message is that he's driving all of our chariots. We just haven't been paying attention, so we haven't noticed. So it looks like the trick to finding one's dharma is to open up a line of communication with Krishna himself. If one's devotion is true, you will intuitively know whether you should fight or run away. Arjun had no such difficulty. He knew without question that his dharma was to fight. Now he has reconciled that and is ready to go. We left off with Arjun having regained his convictions and, to the clamor of both armies, he and Krishna resumed their position among the Pandava forces. The gods and immortal rishis all gathered around up in the sky, setting up folding chairs and beer coolers so they could relax and watch the action down below. But then suddenly, Yudhishthira jumped down and began jogging off to the enemy lines, stripping off his armor as he went. He cast his weapons away and walked in the direction of the car of a commander. Out of respect and concern, his brothers and friends also put down their weapons and followed him out to the enemy side, to witness what he was about to do. Worried, the brothers tried to ask Yudhishthira what he was up to, but they got no reply. Krishna was also with them, and he reassured his friends. He said, don't worry, I know what he's up to. The spectators on the Karava side also thought they knew what he was about. They assumed that whatever qualms that had momentarily taken Arjun out of the fight had now settled on the king, and he was coming over to negotiate a surrender. Among the Dhartarastras, they whispered, Our cousin is a disgrace to the whole clan. He's clearly terrified, and now he's coming with his brothers seeking protection. What a wuss! How did this effeminate sadhu manage to become the firstborn of the Kurus? Meanwhile, Yudhishthira led his brothers, unarmed and on foot, through the bristling ranks of Bhishma's honor guard, paying no heed to their threatening looks. He walked up to Bhishma, knelt, and seized the commander's feet in his hands. He said, I salute you, unconquerable lord. As we are about to fight you, I ask for your blessing. Bhishma was moved by this show of fealty. He said, Had you not come to me, I would have cursed you, and you would have surely lost this battle. But I am pleased with you, my son. May you win victory in this battle, and have all that you wish for. Now, choose a boon. What can I do for you? Yudhishthira said, I understand why you are fighting for the Karva side, and that you are doing the right thing according to your dharma. So I only ask for your advice. Please tell me, how can we defeat you in combat? Bhishma said, That's a tough question, because really, I don't see how anyone can beat me not even Indra himself. And besides, the time for my death has not come. Ask me again later. Yudhishthira accepted this reply, saluted his uncle, and then proceeded to his respected guru, Drona. He bowed to his teacher and asked him, My lord, how may I fight such that I can defeat my enemies, yet incur no sin for it? I can also assure you that with Hari on your side, victory is certain. What else can I do for you? Yudhishthira said, Okay then, tell me, how can I defeat you? Drona was a bit elusive about giving a straight answer. He said, As long as I'm still in the fight, you cannot win. My suggestion is that you and your brothers try to kill me as best you can. 
This wasn't much of an answer, so the king pressed him some more. Can't you tell us more specifically how we might pull that off? I don't think Drona was very interested in getting killed, because his advice was somewhat evasive. He said, As long as I am still fighting, you will never win, so I suggest you try having your brothers kill me. The Yudhishthira pressed him some more, saying, Come on, I'm begging you, how can we kill you? Drona said, Seriously, as long as I'm in the fight, there's no way you'll win, and there's no way you whippersnappers can beat me. However, if I drop my weapons and withdraw my senses ready for death, then I can be killed. If you really must know, I will only do that if I hear something utterly displeasing from a trustworthy man, and that's all. Yudhishthira quietly filed that away, probably pondering whom he could persuade to compromise his honor for the sake of the cause. He then moved on to guru number two, Kripa, and asked for his blessing. Kripa also praised his disciple for having come to pay respects. He asked, what do you wish for, apart from having me change sides? Yudhishthira began to ask the same question he'd ask the others, but it was too much for him. He choked up and could not speak. Kripa knew what he meant to ask, so he went ahead and answered. He said, Fight and may you win victory. I'm pleased you came to me. Every morning when I get up, I shall wish you victory. Finally, Yudhishthira bowed to King Shalya and paid him the same respect. Shalya replied in the same manner as the other elders, but pressed Yudhishthira, asking how he could be of help. Yudhishthira said, just give me your counsel should I need it, and fight as you please on the enemy side. Remember, Shalya was the king who had answered Yudhishthira's call for allies, but was tricked into joining with the Karva side. Shalya pressed Yudhishthira some more. Of course I'm fighting with the Karvas, you know all about that, so what can I do for you? Yudhishthira said, We already talked about this. Do you want me to mention it now? I want you to mess with Karno when he comes out to fight, to throw him off his game, remember? Satisfied, Shalya said, your wish shall be fulfilled, just as you said it. Go with confidence, I promise you victory. Finally, the formalities were over, and Yudhishthira and his posse walked back to their army. Krishna, however, stayed behind and sidled up to Karna. Krishna said, Hey, Karna, I heard you won't fight with the Karvas until Bhishma's dead. Karna said, Yeah, what of it? Krishna said, Why don't you come over and fight with us? You'll get a chance to get in a few good blows against your friends Bhishma and Drona. Then, when Bhishma's dead, you can come back and fight on the other side, like you promised. Karna said, You know better than that. I'd never do anything that would displease Duryodhana. I'm ready to die for him. When the Pandavas were between the opposing lines, Yudhishthira turned back to the Karva army and called out, If there is anyone here who wants to change sides and fight with me, you are welcome to come over. It was Yutsu, Dhritarashtra's 101st son, born of a serving girl and the only Karva to speak out against the dice game, who cheerfully volunteered and drove his chariot to the Pandava camp. Yudhishthira cheered him on, saying, Come on over, we'll fight your witless brothers together. Now at least Dhritarashtra has a chance that some one of his sons will survive to make offerings to his ghost. To the beating of drums, Yudhishthira and the Pandavas took their positions in their army. Yudhishthira retrieved his gilded armor that shone like the sun, and, seeing him surrounded by his four brothers and numerous kings, the soldiers all cheered him, feeling the battle must be good as one. In high spirits, the men pounded on huge kettle drums and blew on thousands of milk-white conches. Describing what he saw to Dhritarashtra, Sanjay said, To the beating of drums, your son Yuyutsu abandoned his kin and went over to Pandu's sons. Then Duryodhana, surrounded by his brothers, advanced with his forces against the Pandava line. With a wild roar, we charged against them and they against us. There was a great tumult. The noise of the army, swarming with kings, elephants, horses, and chariots, was like the ocean in a tempest. Drowning out the rest came Bhima Sena's roar. The pent-up rage and frustration broke forth and made the enemy's hair stand on end. The horses and elephants all defecated at the sound of his terrible war cry. Bhima Sena launched a counterattack, scaring the Dhritarashtra's witless. To counter this frightening assault, a second detachment of Duryodhana's brothers rushed at the Pandava's flank, firing iron arrows. To back up Bhimasena, the sons of Draupadi and Arjun's son Abhimanyu then joined in the fray. So far, only the Kuru clansmen were fighting. The rest of their allies on both sides hung back, perhaps watching to take the measure of the people they had tied their fates to. Eventually, Duryodhana withdrew from the melee and commanded his allies to enter the fight. Only then did the rest of the armies enter the battle. Sanjay was particularly impressed with the Drona's performance. He saw the Brahmin and his acolytes standing their ground and firing arrows with supernatural accuracy and speed.
On both sides, the warriors recalled past grievances they had against some other fighter on the opposite side, and their rage boiled up. Sanjay said the fighting that morning was extraordinarily fierce. At this point, aside from the colorful language, the story of the day's fighting becomes more and more like the running commentary of a sporting event. Bhishma pulled out a gigantic, scary-looking bow and launched an attack on Arjun. The two squared off, but not much came out of the encounter. Satyaki attacked Krittavarman. They both drew blood, but withdrew while still able-bodied. Arjun's heroic son Abhimanyu took on Bhurdbala of Koshala, pumped nine arrows into the guy, and killed his driver and squire. Bhima skirmished with Duryodhana, the violence of which made all the others pause in their fighting to watch. Dushasan attacked Nakul, piercing his guts with razor-tipped arrows. But Nakul was unfazed. He just laughed and returned fire, breaking Dushasan's bow, knocking out his quiver, and sticking him like a pincushion with arrows. A similar duel took place between Sahadev and Durmuka, one of Duryodhana's lesser brothers. The pair only succeeded in killing each other's horses and drivers. Yudhishthira attacked Shalya of the Madras, but his unwilling opponent shot out his bow before he could do any damage. King Drupad's son, the valiant Drusted Yumna, who was born to get revenge on Drona, went right after the old Brahmin. Drona did not hesitate to attack the son of his former friend, and quickly shot out the boy's bow, and then struck him with an arrow. The prince was not deterred. Drusted Yumna stayed in the fight, and neither of the two was able to gain the upper hand. Bhima's Rakshasa son, Gatokacha, was also in the action, fighting a duel with a Rakshasa ally of the Karvas, called Alambusha. Not yet gunning for Bhishma, Sikandin stuck to his father's grudge match with Drona, and attacked Drona's beloved son, Ashvataman. King Drupad had other feuds to attend to. He took on Jayadrata of Sindh, the guy who tried to run off with Drupad's daughter, Draupadi. The two of them were well matched, fighting each other to a standstill. Elsewhere on the battlefield, Yudhishthira's son, Pratavindya, tried to settle an old score of his father's by attacking Shakuni. Sanjay observed that initially the fighting began in a rather formal way, with each warrior facing off with a worthy adversary, all of whom were well matched. This soon grew frustrating for both sides, because no one made any headway. Frustrated with this stalemate, they were soon whipped up into a frenzy and they forgot all proprieties. By late morning, the combatants were ready to throw all the rules of war to the side if they could just kill a few of their enemies. Their brilliant banners were cast aside and ground into the dirt, while broken chariots and dying animals littered the field. Proud kings clambered on foot over the wreckage and fought each other hand to hand, possessed by a demonic frenzy to kill at any cost. Injured elephants, pierced with spears and arrows, stampeded madly across the plain, wildly killing more combatants than any of the vaunted heroes on either side. The lovely sentiment that each fighter would stick to fighting his own kind, infantry against infantry, cavalry against cavalry, was quickly forgotten, as low-born men beheaded noble chariot warriors, and cavalry officers decimated the humble foot soldiers. The high-born of both sides were well-trained and securely armored, thus their fatalities so far were non-existent. But among the lower classes, the bloodshed and slaughter was obscene. The ground was littered with their bodies, all cut up and punctured with missiles. As they screamed in pain and cried for help, the chariots heedlessly rolled right over them, the horses grinding them into pulp, while the wheels sliced through them like ruts in a muddy road. The effect of the elephant's feet on these injured bodies was simply unspeakable. Only then, when the sun had just reached its zenith in the sky, did Bhishma launch his first assault on the main body of the Pandava army. We'll end it here for now. Next time, we'll finish up the first day of the battle and see if either side is able to overcome this stalemate and make some inroads on their opponents. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 62, Day 1 Concluded. Last time, the war finally got underway. We've had several false starts for the past eight episodes, with the armies preparing for war, setting the battle lines, but then stopping to hear one story after another, culminating in the Bhagavad Gita. Following that, you might have thought the war was finally about to begin, but there remained one more delay, when Yudhishthira saw fit to cross into enemy lines and ask for blessings from his elders, gurus, and friends. Like a Vedic sacrifice, the fighting could not begin until all the proper preparations had been made and all formalities observed. Only then, in the last episode, did hostilities finally break out. Despite the vast numbers of commoners ground into hamburger that first morning, the outcome was a draw. Neither side was able to get the upper hand. Some of our heroes were mildly injured, but no one important enough to be named was killed. 
Instead, each warrior was matched up with an opponent of equal skills, so nothing much was accomplished aside from Krishna's overriding objective of sending as many men to the underworld as possible. At that, he was wildly successful. By the end of last episode, the story had become something like a sports wrap-up on TV. We were treated to brief vignettes on whom each hero fought and how each of them fared. I should confess right now that I skipped the duels between the lesser-known characters, such as the face-off between the car of a younger brother Virabahu and Virata's son Utara. I promised that if either had been killed or knocked out of the fight, I would have mentioned it. Like all the other duels of that first morning, even the most obscure engagements were a draw. According to Sanjay, it was this frustrating stalemate that drove both sides into a demonic frenzy where all the niceties of chivalry were thrown out the window and men became willing to attempt anything to get the upper hand. It was then that, in an attempt to upset the balance, Bhishma led a major offensive against the opposing side. Bhishma's banner had the image of a palm tree with five stars around it. As if reflecting that picture, five warriors, Durmukha, Kritavarman, Kripa, Shalya, and Vivinshati formed a guard around the old commander as he led his assault. Thus enforced, Bhishma broke through the Pandava lines, sowing chaos among the ranks. Trying to contain the damage, the Pandava allies were unable to locate Bhishma. Reports came from five different armies that the old man was just then in their midst doing great damage. It seemed like he was in five places at the same time. Arjun's son, Abhimanyu, who had been raised at Dwarka and probably barely knew his old uncle, finally got frustrated at his elder's impotence, and he took matters into his own hand. Ignoring the confusing reports, he just headed straight for the epicenter of all the chaos. As expected, he found the old man wreaking havoc among the elephants. Bearing a banner with a single tree, he took on Bhishma and his honor guard. The first thing he did was strike down Bhishma's palm tree banner. Kritavarman got an arrow in the stomach, and Shalya got stuck five times. Bhishma received nine arrow wounds from his valiant grandnephew. Abhimanyu wasn't done yet. He also decapitated Durmukha's driver and split Kripa's best bow into pieces. The gods, watching from above, put down their popcorn to cheer the young upstart. Bhishma's guard were also quite impressed with Krishna's nephew, thinking how the boy resembled his father in battle. But then Bhishma countered, shooting out the boy's banner and then hitting him with nine arrows, then decapitating the boy's driver. The boy was surrounded and incapacitated, but he did not waver for a second. He simply pressed his attack on the commander while deftly parrying the attacks made by Bhishma's guards. Perhaps surprised to find himself so well matched by this young whippersnapper, Bhishma pulled out a magic spell. As Bhishma chanted an arcane mantra, a thousand glistening arrows suddenly appeared in a wide circle around Abhimanyu and then launched themselves at him from all directions at one time. The boy was hard pressed, but Bhima Sena had already arrived with a relief force. Soon, the spectacular duel between the ancient Kuru and the boy prince was overrun by a flood of combatants, breaking up the encounter before anything could be accomplished. King Virata's son, Utara, was among those who came to Abhimanyu's relief. From atop a mountainous war elephant, Prince Utara squared off with Shalya, who was driving a chariot. The elephant stomped the yoke of the chariot, smashing all the horses in the process. Shalya then threw an iron dart at the prince, which knocked the boy right off the elephant. Swiftly, Shalya drew his sword and cut off the elephant's trunk in a single blow. Screaming horrifically, the elephant collapsed on its rider, killing the boy who had once led Arjun's chariot into battle. Uttar is the first named casualty of the war. There will be many more to follow. The first to react to Uttara's death was his younger brother, Shveta. Infuriated, he assaulted Shalya, who remained on foot, tangled in the mass of chariot parts and elephant guts. Seven warriors, including Jayadratha of Sindh, raced to Shalya's aid, but their arrows were cut down and bows destroyed by the angry prince. With the rescuers now incapacitated, Shveta approached Shalya to finish him off. The boy failed, however, when Duryodhana and Bhishma raced in to rescue good King Shalya. Shalya was rescued and Shveta thrown back, but Sikandin led a counterattack and basically all hell broke loose. A huge cloud of dust rose up and in the confusion countless chariots were destroyed, Drivers killed, and warriors were maimed, then ground into the dirt. Shveta, however, had slipped away, set himself up on a small rise, and showered arrows down on the enemy, killing thousands from a distance. Bhishma then broke off to counter this new threat, concentrating his attack on this one obscure but angry princeling. Tapping into some supernatural reserve of martial power, Shveta found himself dueling with the mighty Bhishma and holding his ground. 
he laughed as he countered Bhishma's attacks and shot out his bows. Shveta took his share of damage, but he somehow had the advantage over the enemy commander. Shocked at this turn of events, Duryodhana organized a rescue for his own protector. Even though Bhishma looked like a porcupine with arrows sticking out of him, he was greatly annoyed that he needed saving. He stood his ground and shot out Shveta's horses. Shveta dropped his bow, grabbed a spear, cried, Hold still, you son of a bitch, and lobbed the missile straight at Bhishma. It was one of those slow motion moments when everyone paused in their fighting to see what would happen next. Swiftly, Bhishma fired nine arrows, all of which struck the missile in mid-flight and sent shards raining harmlessly down. Now consumed by an unthinking frenzy, Virata's son grabbed a massive bludgeon and charged Bhishma. The weight of the blow was too much to stop, so the old man ducked out of the way as it came crashing down. Bhishma threw himself to the ground while his chariot exploded in wood shards and shrapnel. Bhishma stood, and realizing he was unhurt, he heard a voice in his head say, Now is the time, kill him now! A grim smile on his face, Bhishma slowly gathered his bow and a single arrow. Ignoring all the arrows and blows aimed at him, and ignoring the arrows and blows trying to defend him, Bhishma notched this single arrow to his bow and endowed it with a magic spell. While the gods and rishis leaned in to watch, he let this magic arrow fly and it passed right through Shveta's body, and the boy collapsed to the ground lifeless. The Pandavas all wailed and moaned at the loss of these valiant princes, while the Karavas celebrated. Dushasan performed a ridiculous little dance to the sound of the drums. This was the last great duel of the day. The sun had already set, so both sides withdrew for the night. The Pandavas returned to their camp in a depressed mood. Things had looked good on paper, but now that the fighting was underway, it looked like they were in for a long slog. They had made no headway against their enemy, and if you're keeping score, the Pandavas were down 2-0. to zero. Listening to Sanjay tell this heartbreaking story, all King Dhritarashtra had to say was, Wow, that news really glads my heart. I don't even care that the old man cheated and used magic to win. I'm just glad he's definitely fighting for our side. Meanwhile, the Karva camp was in high spirits, and everyone celebrated Bhishma's performance. Things were pretty grim back at the Pandava camp, however. After cleaning up, the brothers set off for Krishna's tent for advice. Yudhishthira said to Krishna, As you could see today, old Bhishma is kicking our butts. We can't seem to beat him, and if we fail, this war will soon be lost. All I'm doing is sending my friends off to hell, with Bhishma as the means of their destruction. I was a great fool in allowing us to get caught up in a fight with him as our enemy. The longer we fight, the more of us will die, so let's forget about it. I'll just find a cabin in the woods and retire. It's better I do that than continue sending these kings to their death. So tell me, what should I do? Shall I give up my claims and retire to the forest? Or can you produce for me a hero who could take Bhishma out of the fight? Krishna tried to soothe the king by restating the facts, which is that Drupad and Dristad Yumna would surely win their revenge, as would Sikandin. Thus Bhishma and Drona would soon enough be neutralized. Pointing out that stopping Bhishma couldn't come soon enough, Yudhishthira addressed his field marshal. He said to Dristad Yumna, Son of Drupad, you are my commander, and I and my brothers give you our full support. Touched by this vote of confidence, Dristad Yumna said, Son of Kunti, I am destined to be the slayer of Drona. I have a plan for tomorrow that will check all of these guys on the field. You see, I know of a formation called the Crown Charuna, which has never been seen in this dimension. So let's use that and see what the Karavas make of it. I suppose this formation resembled a bird of some sort, because Arjun led the van while the others took up the positions of head, neck, back, and right and left wings. It says 10,000 warriors made up each wing, 100,000 made up the head, 100 million made up the back, and 70,000 the neck. This bird must have had the proportions more like a turtle, but whatever. All the soldiers took their positions and waited for daybreak. On the opposite side, Duryodhana took one look at this fancy formation, shrugged, and reminded his captains that their only goal was to protect Bhishma. With no particular order, they all lined up and prepared for the next day's battle to begin. Bhishma resumed his position at the front and center of the army, and watched as the sunlight broke out on the horizon. Krishna blew his Panchanjanya, and Arjun blew on Devadatta, followed by millions of other conches. Vyasa said, the raucous and tumultuous noise reverberated through earth and sky, and so the crews and Pandavas, in high excitement, again assembled for battle, ready to smite one another. I'll stop here for now. This ends the first day of the 18-day Battle of Kurukshetra. Inexplicably, Arjun has been out of the action. I cannot account for what he did all day. 
other than keep out of the way so some of the lesser heroes could win some glory. But don't worry, on day two, Arjun and Bhima will grab center stage, and perhaps they'll finally make some headway. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 63, Kurukshetra, Day 2. Last time, we just finished up the first day of fighting in the Great War. The first half of the day was pretty much a stalemate, although vast numbers of common fighters were exterminated in the process. Old Bhishma tried to tip the scales by launching a major assault on the Pandava lines, but his attack was eventually stopped and turned back by King Virata's two sons. Both boys made the ultimate sacrifice, but the offensive was stopped and indeed rolled back. As an aside, Dhritarashtra provided a bit of obscure gossip about these two princelings. When commenting on how Bhishma cheated by using magic to kill Shveta, the blind king also made a reference to these brothers. He said he was amazed at Shveta's performance because Shveta had always been unhappy and jealous that his brother Uttara had been chosen as their father's heir. Things had gotten bad enough that Shveta had even fled his father's kingdom and had been living under the Pandava's protection or in their service. The translator notes that this obscure story is never mentioned elsewhere, but it seems Dhritarashtra was surprised that Shveta showed so much passion over the slaying of his older brother. We know that when Uttara rode out with Arjun to fend off the cattle raid, he was a braggart who also proved to be a coward in battle. We can see that, while his bravery improved, his battle skills left much to be desired, since Shalya dispatched him with relative ease. So it is probably safe to assume that the jealousy sprang up from the fact that the heir was much inferior to his younger brother in war, and this led to the friction in the family. I guess it's no matter now. Both boys are dead, and it remains to be seen what will become of Virata's patrimony. I think the big mystery about day one is, where was Arjun? He is mentioned as sort of being around while this fighting is going on, but why was it up to Virata's two less than illustrious sons to save the day? The only answer I can come up with is that Krishna needed a lot of people to die, and if Arjun were to get started too soon, he might accidentally finish the war before everyone who needed to die was actually dead. According to Sanjay, the second day of fighting began at dawn shortly after Duyodhana had inspected his army and exhorted them to victory. There were no more formalities than that, both sides just set in to trying to kill each other. This time, Bhishma did not dilly-dally. He just launched his attack on the Pandava center. It didn't take long before Dristad Yumna's otherworldly formation was shattered beyond recognition. Large numbers of Pandava charioteers and footmen were soon routed. Arjun saw this large portion of his army fleeing the field and finally decided to intervene. To counter Bhishma's incursion, he directed Krishna to drive them straight at the Karva commander, scattering Karva warriors to each side as he advanced. Bhishma was not the only Karva paladin on the scene, however, and Arjun soon found himself surrounded by such luminaries as Drona, Kripa, Shalya, and Duryodhana. As he raced to confront Bhishma, these Karvas took turns sticking Arjun with arrows. Soon the Pandava was pierced with arrows and completely cornered. The enemies pressed in until the crowding made it difficult for them to get in a blow. That was the moment Arjun counterattacked, creating so many corpses that the living were unable to get away from his arrows. Arjun returned the arrows that had struck him, stabbing Bhishma 25 times, Drona 10, Kripa 9, and Duryodhana 5. These commanders were all driven back, and their less well-armed underlings were swiftly going extinct. In frustration, Duryodhana yelled over to Bhishma, What's the holdup? Arjun is wiping us out, and Karna is sitting over there, ready to kill him in a second, once you are out of the way. So get out there and stop him. Cursing the Dharma of Kshatriya, Bhishma goaded his horses forward to the attack. The duel consumed thousands of arrows, and soon both of their chariots were shot to pieces. Bhishma also sent three arrows right into the center of Krishna's chest, knocking him back and drawing blood. In return, Arjun angrily killed Bhishma's driver with three arrows of his own. Both combatants were able to find new chariots and the duel continued. Both fighters were supernaturally skilled, and even though the gods themselves marveled at their performance, neither was able to gain the advantage. The judgment of these divine onlookers was that these guys were so well matched that they might fight for ages and neither would be able to beat the other. The same could not be said about the bystanders, thousands of whom were killed in passing by these two juggernauts. Listening to Sanjay recount all this, Dhritarashtra was concerned. He said, fate must be weighing heavily on the scales, because in normal circumstances, Bhishma could destroy the world. But here he is struggling with just one opponent. How is it that he can't get the upper hand? Sanjay said, you better brace yourself, my lord, because the Pandavas are on the side of righteousness, 
and this makes them invincible. Not even Indra could defeat them. As people lost interest in watching this interminable duel, skirmishes broke out elsewhere, including a face-off between Drona and Drupad's son Drustadyumna. It seemed that Drona might have been a bit intimidated, if not frightened, by the attack of this prince who was born to be his killer. I say this because the Brahmin fighter quickly resorted to his magic weapons, using them against a decidedly non-magical warrior. Drona drew out a nuclear-tipped arrow that glowed and crackled as he notched it to his bow. The nearby fighters all stopped to see how Drupad's son would survive this dirty trick. Drusted Yumna did not back down, nor did he run away. Instead, he patiently stood his ground and waited for Drona to launch his missile. Soon, as the glowing arrow was hurtling to his imminent destruction, Drusted Yumna fired a single arrow into its path, deflecting it out of the air and disarming its warhead in the process. People on both sides cheered his bravery as he followed up with a volley of iron arrows that fell all around Drona like rain. The guru danced from side to side to avoid their flight, and then shot out Drusted Yumna's bow. The prince produced a second bow, and it too was knocked to pieces, and his driver was killed. He seized a club and threw it at Drona, but again the wily Brahmin dodged it. Like a frenzied lion attacking an elephant, Drusted Yumna grabbed a golden shield and broadsword and charged his ancient enemy, determined to finish this encounter once and for all. Bhima also joined in the fight, providing cover while Drusted Yumna made his assault. But suddenly, the army of the Kalingas swept onto the field, breaking up the duel. Drona was happy to exploit this reprieve, and found himself someone else to fight, while Bhima and Drusted Yumna were occupied with the flood of Kalingas who suddenly crowded around them. The disappointment of breaking off with Drona was soon made up for by the opportunity to kill lots and lots of Kalingas. Bhima Sena was soon a wholesale agent of Lord Yama, laughing as he dispatched hundreds of soldiers at a time. In an effort to save his followers, the prince of the Kalingas, Shakradeva, attacked Bhima with a shower of arrows and then hurled one javelin at the other at him. Bhima deflected each of them, all the while advancing on his foe, a scary grin on his face, his body bathed in blood. Bhima raised up his iron club and threw it at Shakradeva's head, killing him instantly. Now, Bhanumat, king of the Kalingas and Shakradeva's father, entered the fray to avenge his son. Bhima's joy and bloodlust was beginning to creep out a lot of the fighters, but few lived long enough to cast judgment. As for Banamat, as soon as he came within range of Bhima's sword, he was sliced in two at the waist. Like a giant wading through a field of tulips, Bhima cut swathes of soldiers down, leaving a trail of gore and misery as he rampaged through the ranks of the Kalingas. Soon, a large portion of the Kalinga army was wiped out. Only riderless horses and rampaging elephants remained on the field, trampling the injured soldiers. Bhima paused for a moment, his bloodlust briefly sated, and gave a terrific blow on his horn, stupefying the remaining traumatized Kalinga fighters. That was all they could stand. The remnants of the Kalingas turned and ran for the cover of the nearby woods. Now, with the Kalinga army in full rout, the rest of the Karva soldiers began to waver. Covered from head to foot in blood and gore, towering over his opponents, Bhima appeared to them as Yama himself, come from the underworld to gather fresh souls. Seeing the lines were faltering, Bhishma rushed over and soon Bhima and Bhishma were locked in a duel. Bhishma Devavrata struck his nephew with a handful of arrows and killed his horses. Bhima hurled a spear at the old man, then grabbed his bludgeon and jumped down. The spear was cut to pieces by Bhishma's arrows, but Setyaki got in a good shot and killed Bhishma's driver. Being Bhishma's driver was definitely not a safe occupation. Now driverless, Bhishma's horses panicked. The old man was a skillful driver himself, so he grabbed the reins and turned the horses back to the main force, where he might recruit another unlucky driver. Now Bhima Sena held the field. The Kalingas were exterminated, and no one else dared confront him. Drusted Yumna came racing by, embraced his champion, and gave Bhima a lift back to camp, where he could fetch new horses. Elsewhere on the battlefield, a minor skirmish soon flared up into a major confrontation. It began when Arjun's son, Abhimanyu, found himself face to face with Duryodhana's son, Lakshman. This was a proper duel, and the two boys traded blows, both getting wounded in the process. Seeing his son losing ground, Duryodhana organized an ambush, and he and his cronies all jumped the boy from behind, while Lakshman slipped away. Now Abhimanyu is surrounded by a pack of older, seasoned warriors. Everyone watching felt that this was an unfair move, and Arjun was moved to rejoin the fighting. Seeing the balance suddenly tipped in the pond of his favor, Bhishma and Drona rushed to support the Karavas. It didn't do much good, however. 
Arjun's stream of arrows was vast and relentless, literally blocking out the sun. Terrified warriors dropped their weapons and fled to escape this deadly rain. Sanjay said that he could see chariot warriors, who had thrown off all their weapons and armor, attempting to lighten their load so they could get out of there as quickly as possible. Soon enough, Arjun had cleared out a swath of the battlefield that extended the distance of the range of his arrows. Satisfied, Arjun paused briefly, and he and Krishna gave a big triumphant blast on their conches. From a safe distance, Bhishma said, Only Dhananjaya could accomplish such a feat. Look at our soldiers, they are all terrified. I don't think it would be possible to rally a counter-strike. But the sun has done us a favor and has dropped beneath the mountains. I suggest we withdraw for the night. Drona heartily agreed, and the armies were summoned back to their camps for the night. This ends the second day of battle. So far, it seems the score is about even. The Karvas clearly won the first day, while Arjun and Bhima dominated the second day of battle. So far, the only named casualties are Virata's two sons, so I guess that puts the Karvas in a slight lead over their opponents. I'm afraid it makes light of warfare to keep score like this, as if it were a sporting event, but unfortunately, I suspect the author intended us to think of it that way. It is one of the great aspects of this story, that it draws you to the point where you feel that war is the only solution to everyone's problems, and we all look forward to seeing the bad guys get their due. The war starts nicely enough. We feel good because we know the good guys cannot fail to win. But as the actual carnage grinds on for day after day, it starts to make you wonder, is war ever a good solution to our problems? Where else can you get such a subtle take on the nature of human conflict? That's why we love the Mahabharata. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, episode 64, Kurukshetra, days 3 and 4. Last time, on day 2, the Pandava commander, Drishtad Yumna, had arranged his forces according to an arcane, bird-like design. Yudhishthira wholeheartedly endorsed this plan, but once the fighting started, the whole fancy arrangement was quickly shattered by Bhishma's assault. When tactics and stratagems failed, Arjun and Bhima stepped up and saved the day by sheer brute force. On the dawn of the third day, the Karvas took a turn at devising an elaborate formation. Bhishma ordered them to array in the shape of the Garuda, or Heavenly Eagle, who is Vishnu's mount. Bhishma placed himself at the tip of the beak, while Drona's son Ashvataman led the head, Jayadrata the neck, Duryodhana and his brothers held the central position or back, while three armies composed the left wings, and four armies made up the right wing. Like a grand chess game, Dristid Yumna counter-arrayed his forces into the shape of a giant crescent, with Bhima Sena, Virata, and Drupad on the right tip, and Arjun holding the left, while the remaining brothers, their sons, and Dristid Yumna made up the center. I guess this time, the fancy formations had the desired effect, because both sides held, and neither could advance against the other. Soon, the no-man's land between the armies were so littered with corpses that the opponents had trouble striking at each other. To get around this colossal pile of gore, Bhishma went around and attacked the Pandavas from the left flank. He soon had that part of the formation break open and chaos ensued. Bhima, on the opposite end, had the same idea and broke through the left flank of the Karavas, sowing death and destruction among the reserve troops. Bhishma left them to fend for themselves and pressed his assault on the Pandavas. Amidst the chaos of fleeing soldiers, only Arjun held his ground. Soon he alone was holding back the combined might of the Karva vanguard. But if anyone could do that, it was Arjun. The audience of gods and rishis all cheered and praised Palguna for this marvelous performance. Duryodhana's gambling uncle Shakuni led his Gandhari contingent against Setyaki and destroyed his chariot. Abhimanyu picked him up and the pair routed Shakuni, sending him and his army running for cover. Bhima and his Rakshasa son Gatok Kacha were now deep in enemy territory, tearing up the place. Duryodhana attempted to repulse them and got an arrow in the chest, like a love letter straight from Bhima's heart. The Karva slumped over in his car in a dead faint. The counterattack was itself repulsed, and as Duryodhana's driver sped him away from danger, his soldiers began to break and run for cover. Now Bhishma and Drona had to break off their attack, and they rushed back to stem the building panic. Abhimanya and Setyaki in a single chariot just picked off Shakuni's soldiers like fish in a barrel. Arjun also joined in the fun, driving the Karvas nearly into a full rout. His chariot rattling along at the front of his fleeing army, Duryodhana suddenly awoke. He regained his senses, realized what was happening, and ordered his driver to turn around and face the enemy, no matter the cost. This courageous stand shamed his commanders, and they all turned their men around and resumed the fight. 
Once the battle lines had stabilized and order was restored to the army, Duryodhana sought out his commander. Disregarding the arrow still sticking out of his chest, Duryodhana got into Bhishma's face and yelled at him. I was unconscious for like 10 minutes, and when I woke up, I found my army in full retreat. At first I assumed you were dead, because how else could you let this happen? Why didn't you tell me before we started this that you favored the enemy and would not fight them to the best of your ability? Had I known that, I would have put Karna in charge. If you still respect your dharma and are still on my side, then get out there and straighten this out. Bhishma tried to contain his annoyance and said, My lord, I've told you a million times. The Pandavas cannot be beaten in battle. Not even Indra could do that. Nevertheless, I will do what I can. So now watch me as I beat back their advance and restore your place on the field. Duryodhana's brothers all gave each other high fives, chest butted each other, and cheered, while the elderly Bhishma, his joints creaking, stood to his full height, summoned up to Shakti power, and launched himself at the rampaging Pandavas in their midst. As the sun reached its zenith in the sky and began its slow progress toward dusk, Bhishma single-handedly broke the Pandavas' onslaught. Seeming to be everywhere at once, he slaughtered enemy soldiers by the dozen. With one arrow, he would impale two or three elephant drivers, and with the second arrow, killed the mass of beasts beneath them. Arjun and Bhimasena were both undaunted, but they soon saw all their comrades fallen, faltering, or running away. Krishna was the first to recognize that Bhishma was not only restoring the old battle lines, he was about to push the Pandava army right off the battlefield. He drew up the horses and called over to Arjun. He said, Okay, my friend, this is it, the moment you've been waiting for. Remember your oaths to kill the Karvas and anyone who fought on their side? So now, if you have not resumed your delusional thinking, I suggest you make good on your promise and put an end to this right now. As he gazed out over the swarms of fleeing soldiers and the growing panic and disorder, Arjun said, Lay on the whip, take me to Bhishma, let's do this. The mere sight of Dhananjaya and Vasudev racing to confront the terrible Bhishma was enough to rally the faltering troops. All lesser opponents were knocked aside as Krishna steered a direct course for this most formidable of opponents. As their car rolled into range, Bhishma showered them with arrows, but Arjun shot out his bow. In the blink of an eye, Bhishma produced a second bow. It too was just as swiftly shot out. Bhishma paused then to applaud his nephew. He shouted, Well done, mighty Partha! I'm immensely pleased with your valor. Now, let's fight! The old guy then pulled out an extra thick bow and resumed trying to kill his nephew. He got in a few good hits, but this only served to piss off Arjun and his driver. The two Krishnas, Arjun and Vasudev, were able to avoid the worst of Bhishma's attack, but their comrades were not so lucky. Thousands were killed in the crossfire, and soon Krishna began to suspect that his friend was holding back. Having been struck by a good number of arrows himself, and watching the Pandava's foot soldiers melting away, Krishna began to get annoyed. Krishna announced to Arjun that he was beginning to get pissed off. He said, I'm getting pretty sick and tired of getting stuck with that man's arrows, and you're not doing anything about it. Now that I'm annoyed, I'm going to pull out my Sudarshana Chakra and finish off Bhishma and Drona for you. In fact, if you don't want to go through this, I'll go ahead and kill off all your enemies and put an end to this right now. Not waiting for a reply, Krishna jumped down off the chariot, produced his magic frisbee, and began running straight for Bhishma, the ground shaking beneath his feet. The entire universe seemed to groan at the prospect of Krishna's fury. Bhishma saw this, and he put down his bow and spread out his arms. He said, Come quickly, Lord of the gods, protector of the world. Strike me down and do it quickly, because if I am killed by you in combat, it would be the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. Great hero, you honor me with your assault. Meanwhile, Arjun had also leapt from the chariot and ran after Krishna. He dove at Krishna's waist, grabbed him, and attempted to tackle him to the ground. But by now, Vishnu had fully entered Krishna's body, and Arjun's massive body was dragged along like a child. While Krishna angrily ran forward, Arjun's grip slipped somewhat, and soon he was only holding onto one ankle. Krishna continued to drag him like this for ten steps, and then he paused to see what was the matter. Arjun jumped at the opportunity and prostrated himself on the ground before his friend. Begging, he said, Please, curb your wrath. I swear to you by my sons and my brothers that I will carry out my duty. I promise I will exterminate the Kurus. Just don't go on with this. Hearing Arjun's oath, Krishna stopped and smiled. Arjun had been reminded of his dharma, so Krishna had done his part. Content, the Lord put out his magic disc and returned to the driver's seat of Arjun's chariot. The Karva leadership all suddenly realized they had been holding their breaths. They had narrowly missed the end of everything. 
but now they could resume fighting. Arjun, however, attacked with renewed violence. Bhishma and the other generals found themselves making a rearguard defense while their soldiers resisted the impulse to run away. Even though it was nearing dusk already, Arjun did immense damage to the Karva forces. In the remaining hours of daylight, he managed to exterminate 10,000 noble chariot warriors, 700 elephants, and countless foot soldiers. The nations of Savira, Kshudraka, and Malava were pretty much exterminated that day. Sensing the deep fear of Arjun among his exhausted troops, Duryodhana ordered bright fires and torches be lit throughout the night so that the soldiers could sleep without fear that Arjun might take them in the night. The following morning, the fourth day of fighting, started with the Pandavas using a defensive formation, with legions of elephants on both flanks and the bulk of the army in between. Like the day before, the heart of the fighting centered on the continuing duel between Arjun and Bhishma. Perhaps Arjun was still holding back somewhat, because the pair remained evenly matched. Bystanders were astonished to see Arjun's arrows shot out of the air by Bhishma as they rained down on him. Elsewhere, Arjun's son Abhimanyu single-handedly confronted a handful of Dhritarashtra's grandsons. The twins, Nakul and Sahadev, the two sons of Madri, together dueled with their uncle King Shalya. Meanwhile, Bhima Sena spotted a handful of Duryodhana's brothers, grabbed his mace, and charged at them, hoping to fulfill his vow to kill all the sons of Dhritarashtra. The cousins all turned and fled at the sight of his onslaught, and Duryodhana was forced to take defensive action. The Karva prince led a battalion of elephants to cut off Bhima's charge. Bhima Sena was a famous elephant killer, however, so he grabbed his extra-large iron cudgel and jumped off his chariot to confront these mountainous beasts. As the animals charged him, Bhima nimbly clobbered each one on the head and then jumped out of the way as the enormous beasts came crashing to the earth. Elephants are not stupid, and soon the survivors simply refused to be goaded into the Pandava's presence. The monstrous creatures ignored their masters and gathered like steers in a timid herd, refusing to enter the combat. The situation resembled a medieval hunt, with the beasts all penned together, while Dristid Yumna led a division of archers to pick off the tamed animals at their leisure. Soon the entire Magadan contingent of elephants had been slaughtered, resembling an archipelago of mountainous corpses in a sea of blood, their decapitated and impaled masters still hanging from their flanks. Now, only the king of Magadha, atop the largest elephant, remained alive. Furious at the destruction of his finest mounts, the king charged at Abhimanyu, who was on foot, armed with only a bow and a sword. Arjun's son held his ground as the enormous creature barreled inexorably forward. Once the beast was in range, Abhimanyu let fly a single arrow, which entered the creature's eye and pierced its brain. As the monster collapsed to the ground, the Magadan king jumped clear, but was immediately met by Krishna's nephew, who struck off his head in an instant. Bhima Sena, drenched in blood and greased by the fat and marrow of countless elephants, seemed to dance like Shiva at the end of time as he slaughtered his foes. Seeing his army waver, Duryodhana called up his reserve troops and directed them all to attack Bhima at once. Despite this massive push on the Karva's side, Bhima held his ground while his friends and relations all rushed to his aid. Even though Duryodhana had thrown the entirety of his superior numbers against Bhima, they made no headway against him. This huge assault had the unexpected benefit of concentrating Bhima's enemies in one small area. He saw Duryodhana and his brothers all standing nervously together. Unable to resist this tempting opportunity, Bhima broke off and charged his cousins. He remounted his chariot and fired arrows at Duryodhana as he charged at the sons of Dhritarashtra. This impetuous charge had led Bhima into something of an ambush, however and he soon found himself being stuck by arrows on all sides. Everywhere he looked, he saw his cousins firing arrows into his chariot, and he had become cut off from his allies. Repeatedly struck by arrows, he was soon overcome by the onslaught. He roared weakly and then collapsed like an inverted porcupine. The Dardarastras all cheered and moved in for the kill. Abhimanyu, Dristid Yumna, and the twins were too far away to help, but close enough to witness Bhima's agony. Fourteen of Duryodhana's brothers ran up to Bhima's bloody and broken chariot to finish him off. Under normal circumstances, Bhima would have been a dead man, but the opportunity was too good for him to let pass, so somehow, when his cousins were at arm's length, Bhima found new life. He sprang up, ripped the arrows from his armor, and used them to kill all fourteen of his Dardarastra assailants. Only eighty-six more to go. Bhima might have been heartily satisfied at this turn of events, but he was not out of the woods yet. He was still badly injured and surrounded by Duryodhana and his bodyguard. The aggrieved Karavas continued to pour arrows down on the injured Pandava until he once again fell to the ground. 
more cautiously this time, the Karvas moved in for the kill. But before they could get near their victim, a Rakshasa came smashing down from the sky, scattering the attackers. It was Bhima's son, Gato Kacha, come to the rescue. Within moments, additional Rakshasas appeared at his side, all mounted on monstrous four-tusked elephants, fresh for battle. Bhishma took one look at the situation, checked his watch, and said, Forget about it. We're all tired. It's almost dusk, and those guys look mean. Let's call it off for the night. It was a grim night for the Karvas. The generals were all shamed by their inability to stop Bhima, and Duryodhana commenced mourning and funerary rites for his fallen brothers. The Pandavas, despite their injuries and fatigue, celebrated Bhima and his son all through the night. This ends the fourth day of the battle. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 65, Kurukshetra, Days 5 and 6. Last time, we covered the third and fourth days of the war. It made sense to group those two days together, because on both days the Pandavas seemed to have gained the upper hand. Bhima is clearly 100% committed to seeing this through, while Arjun is slowly beginning to see the light, and is beginning to get serious about victory. Not that he isn't struggling, however. Last episode contained the famous scene in which Krishna becomes annoyed with Arjun's reluctance, and he decides to kill Bhishma and everyone else by himself. According to legend, this is when Krishna decides to bend the rules. He had promised not to take up arms in this battle, so he finds a loophole in that oath. Instead of taking up arms against his tormentors, Krishna instead grabs a loose chariot wheel and rushes at Bhishma, intending to clobber him with it. Arjun tries to prevent this because he knows that this interpretation of Krishna's oath is sophistry at best. Arjun only stops Krishna when he promises to stick to his dharma and fight. This is a lovely story, one of my favorites, and I've used a famous painting of this scene on my blog. I even made a funny animation using Flash in which Krishna's wagon wheel bounces off of Bhishma's head. Unfortunately, this story is just barely in the original. I checked Ganguly's Bombay and Calcutta recensions, and also the critical edition, and both agree that there was no chariot wheel, nor is there any mention made of Krishna's oath. In fact, we are left guessing as to what Arjun's motivation was for stopping Krishna at this point. In the original, Krishna gets annoyed, pulls out his Sudarshana Chakra, and moves to kill Bhishma and all the Karavas in an instant. Arjun doesn't explain why, he just races after his friend to prevent it. Certainly the best explanation is probably that Arjun did not want Krishna to violate his oath not to fight, but this is definitely not stated. Another reason for Arjun's behavior may be Krishna's injunction in the Gita when he says it is better to do your own dharma poorly than to do someone else's dharma well. In this event, the death of Bhishma and defeat of the Karavas is ultimately Arjun's responsibility. To have Krishna intervene and do it for him would have been disastrous for his soul. It's funny how some of the best stories from the Mahabharata are not actually in the Mahabharata. I occasionally get messages from listeners telling me details they had heard as a child that turn out not to have been in the epic at all. I would propose that now that we have a trimmed down, minimalistic, critical edition, we should create a maximalist edition in which all those great legends, myths, and folk tales get included as part of the great national epic. But getting back to the story, we left off on the night of the fourth day of battle. The Pandavas, despite their injuries and weariness, celebrated Bhima's success of that day. He had finally cashed in on his oath to kill his Karva cousins. He still had 86 to go, but 14 was a good start. The mood was not nearly so cheerful in the Karva camp. Duryodhana was absorbed in the elaborate duties of mourning required of the eldest brother. His troops were all traumatized by the sight of Bhima's supernatural slaughter that day and Arjun's exterminations of the day before. To reassure them and allow them a few hours of sleep, bright fires were lit all around the camp and guards were stationed at all sides, so that the foot soldiers need not fear the Pandava's supernatural talent for killing, at least for the night. Meanwhile, the story of the last couple of days really had King Dhritarashtra worried. He interrupted Sanjay's narration of the fifth day with a question. He said, I find it astonishing and terrifying that the Pandavas have inflicted so much damage against our side. This doesn't make any sense. Why is Bhishma having such a hard time against these boys? Why is it so difficult to kill these Pandavas? What's their trick? Did they learn some special magic? I cannot bear to hear how the enemy has again and again slaughtered my troops. Fate has singled me out for the worst punishment to see the Pandavas inviolable while my sons are doomed to be slaughtered. I am like a drowning man lost in a sea of sorrow. Sanjay said, Now, now, don't you remember that Vidur warned you all this would happen? But let me assure you, the Pandavas are not using magic. It's no trick. 
The sons of Pritha live and act righteously, and where there is righteousness, there is victory. And that is why the Pandavas are inviolable, whereas your sons are ill-natured and always intent on evil. They are cruel and vile in their deeds, and that is why they suffer losses in combat. Your sons have performed countless crimes against the sons of Pandu, but they have always been forbearing in return. The horrific fruit of all that evil has now ripened, and now you, along with your sons and allies, must now eat that fruit, since you did not heed the warnings of your well-wishers. It's funny, but your son asked the same question of Bhishma that night, as his brother's bodies were prepared for cremation. Duryodhana said to Bhishma, I have seen you and your generals fight in the past, and when you and Drona and Kripa and Ashvataman fight on the same side, there's no one who can stop you. So how is it that these young men, who spent their lives starving in the forest, are able to withstand your attack and even repulse our superior army? What is their trick? Bhishma said, I have told you this many times, but you won't listen, so listen to me now. Make peace with your cousins. Do that, and everyone, including yourself, will benefit. Together you will conquer the earth and enjoy all its riches. As for why you can't beat them, well, nobody can do that, and there never will be anyone who can defeat them, so long as they are protected by Krishna. And you do know who Krishna is, right? You realize that even Brahma, the creator of the universe, praises and honors Krishna as the universe's savior. It is Krishna who maintains the three worlds. He is everlasting and all-pervading. Krishna is the embodiment of victory, and where there is righteousness, there is Krishna. And where there is Krishna, there is victory. I have learned this from the great sages Rama Jamadagnya, Markandeya, Vyasa, and Narada. Knowing this by their divine authority, how is it that you do not revere and worship Vasudev? You have been repeatedly warned by the sages not to start a fight with Krishna and the Pandavas. But in your delusion, you failed to comprehend their meaning. I think you must be a cruel demon, shrouded in darkness and ignorance. That must be the reason you hate Krishna and Arjun so much. What loving human could possibly hate the divine Narnarayan? For once, Duryodhana seemed a bit intrigued by the idea that Arjun's drinking buddy might also be the supreme being incarnate. Bhishma, on the other hand, only became increasingly tired and dejected. He again encouraged Duryodhana to make peace with his cousins, and then went alone to his tent to prepare for the next day's fighting. At dawn of the fifth day, Bhishma arrayed his army in the formation resembling a crocodile while Dristed Yumna on the other side picked an eagle formation, with Bhimasena at its beak. The two armies went at each other with their usual ferocity, but with fourteen of his brothers already dead, Duryodhana was losing faith in his commander. When Bhishma was fully occupied with the battle, Duryodhana sidled up to Drona and said, I can't believe my old grandfather is having so much trouble with these cowardly Pandavas. You have always been my teacher and ally, so please do something about this stalemate. Drona didn't bother to say anything. He just launched himself at full speed toward the battle lines, crashed right through the Pandava's front line, and began wreaking havoc in the rear. Satyaki rushed to stop the rampaging Brahmin, but got an arrow through the shoulder for his efforts. Now Bhima, who was right at the front, was in real danger of being cut off from his allies. While he faced Bhishma's attack from the front, and Drona's arrows came from behind, Sikandin entered the breach in Bhima's defense. Old Bhishma didn't want to have anything to do with that cross-dressing transvestite, so he broke off and went looking for someone else to fight. The sight of mighty Bhishma hesitating before this young man unnerved Drona somewhat, and soon the situation was turned around. Now the Pandavas were on the offensive, and Drona was in real danger of getting cut off himself. Soon Arjun and Bhishma were fully occupied in a duel, while Duryodhana led his brothers in an attempt to rescue Drona. Bhima could not resist the temptation, and he went right after his cousins, hoping to rid the world of a few more Karavas as soon as possible. The battle wavered like this on the razor's edge as the sun reached its zenith. Both sides wavered and felt as if they were about to break, while they also sensed victory might finally be in their grasp. This situation was soon transformed into a brutal slog. The reserves on both sides were fully committed, men were dying at an alarming rate, but neither side could advance against the other. Sikandin was perfectly aware of the effect he was having on his old nemesis, so he used it to his best advantage by appearing at the side of everyone Bhishma chose to attack. In each case, the old crew was compelled to break off fighting and find someone else to kill. Soon, the battle descended into a chaotic melee, with fighters squaring off briefly, then being carried off by the crowds to fight someone else. At one point, Arjun found himself facing Guru Drona's ill-fated son Ashvataman. Arjun struck the boy with a handful of arrows and was then confronted by Bhishma, so he broke off that duel to fight with his granduncle. 
Next, Bhimasena found himself facing that same wounded young Brahmin. Bhima saw a clear opportunity to finish the boy off right then, but then he reconsidered, thinking to himself, This is my guru's dear son, and a Brahmin as well. Thus he is doubly deserving of my respect. Bhima declined to kill Ashvataman, and instead went looking elsewhere for people to kill. In that moment of hesitation, Duryodhana sent an arrow flying at Bhima that struck his helmet hard. This only enraged the Pandava, and in an instant he fired a hailstorm of iron-tipped arrows back at his cousin, embedding one of them squarely into Duryodhana's broad chest. As these belligerent cousins continued fighting like this, Krishna's kinsman Setyaki found himself nearly surrounded by a battalion of charioteers led by King Burishravas. I find Setyaki to be a bit of a mysterious character. He seems to come out of nowhere. In the Book of Virata, where he appears for the first time and makes a speech in support of the Pandavas, Unlike the peripheral characters, like Dristid Yumna or Shalya, Setyaki has no backstory. Just before the war begins, he appears, is introduced as a cousin of Krishna's, and then becomes an important warrior in the Great War. So now, when he is cut off and nearly surrounded, we are told that he also has ten full-grown sons, all of whom are fighting with him at Kurukshetra. It is these ten sons who rode out to rescue their father from being encircled by his enemies. The boys rushed in and managed to kill or maim most of Burishrava's chariot fighters. Burishrava's himself was no slouch, however. Angry at seeing his best fighters all killed, he shot ten arrows that destroyed the bows of Setyaki's ten sons. Before the boys could react, another ten arrows came flying their way and decapitated all ten of Setyaki's sons. By now, the only survivors of that encounter were Burishrava's and Setyaki. Screaming, Setyaki flung himself into the fight against the man who had just exterminated his offspring. He literally crashed his chariot head-on into his opponent's car, killing both teams of horses and shattering both chariots. They both jumped clear of the wreckage and continued fighting on foot. The pair fought relentlessly like this until well past sunset. All the other fighters had already turned in for the night, and finally Bhima and Duryodhana had to ride out and physically detain their heroes and return with them to their respective camps. This was the last significant action of the fifth day. The only other action of note that afternoon was the extermination of an army of 25,000 soldiers. This vast force had been sent out with the specific order to kill Arjun and his son. Not a single soldier got out of that encounter alive. On the morning of day six, Yudhishthira directed his general to array the army using the crocodile formation. King Drupad and Arjun held the position of the two eyes while Bhima stood in for the mouth. Bhishma responded to this formation by arraying his own army in the shape of a great bird. As soon as the first rays of dawn appeared in the sky, the two diminished armies flew at each other with as much violence as ever. The two armies remained evenly matched, so the battle lines did not budge all that morning. The two exceptions were the places where Bhim and Arjun led the attack. At those positions, the Karvas found themselves being slowly but steadily pushed back on themselves. Duryodhana tried to remedy this by sending his brothers to firm up the lines before Bhima's attack. The sight of so many cousins in one place had the opposite effect, however, and Bhima impatiently jumped off his chariot, leapt clear over the heads of the Karva infantry, and landed among a gaggle of his Dardarastra cousins. Of course, Bhima Sena had made a huge tactical mistake. Now he was on foot and completely surrounded by his enemies. Perceiving the situation he was in, Bhima let out a mighty roar and swung his cudgel in wide arcs to keep back his hordes of attackers. On the other side of the battle lines, Dristid Yumna heard the familiar roar and went looking for his brother-in-law. What he found was an empty chariot with Bhima's forlorn driver, Vishoka, sitting there nervously, awaiting the return of his master. The Pandava commander inquired of Vishoka what had happened to Bhima. The driver replied, saying, all I know is that he caught a glimpse of his cousins grouped on the enemy's side, and he told me to wait here while he rids the world of some vermin. Then he leapt right over the heads of the soldiers and disappeared in a crowd of enemy fighters. Dristid Yumna then peered across, beyond the enemy lines, and was able to make out a trail of corpses, leading to a great tumult occurring near the enemy camp. He said, I have been entrusted with the safekeeping of the Pandava army, and I could never face them if Bhima were to get killed. I'd sooner die fighting than face that. So saying, he whipped his horses into a full gallop and crashed through the enemy lines in support of his brother-in-law. Relying entirely on the speed and momentum of his charge, Dristid Yumna burst through the circle of attackers surrounding Bhim and helped him climb onto his chariot. While Bhim had been relieved somewhat by Dristid Yumna's arrival, now both of them were surrounded. 
The Karvas now had two great prizes in their grasp, so they redoubled their effort to trap and kill the pair. Drusted Yumna still had a trick up his sleeve. He produced a magic stupefaction spell and set it off in the midst of the fight, blasting the wits out of their attackers and leaving them lying unconscious on the ground. Old Drona happened to be nearby, however, and he was able to counter the spell quickly enough, and soon the Karva fighters were back on their feet and back in the fight. By now, Yudhishthira was missing his brother in general, and he sent his sons, led by Abhimanyu, to seek out and rescue his lost brothers. Using his keen senses, Abhimanyu soon discovered the whereabouts of his uncles. He had ordered his cousins to form a tight wedge, and they pierced the enemy lines and swiftly joined up with Bhima and Dristed Yumna. This second rescue attempt was successful. The rest of the Pandava army were able to follow into the breach made by Abhimanyu, and soon they were all reunited into a single battle front. Through all of this, Bhima had hardly moved, so intent he was in killing his cousins. He specifically focused his attack on cousin Duryodhana, killing his horses, piercing him with arrows, and finally shooting down his proud banner. As the gem-encrusted banner of the king of the Kurus fell heavily to the ground, the king himself fainted with exhaustion and blood loss. Jayadratha of Sindh, no friend of Bhima's, raced over to Duryodhana's aid, loaded him onto his own chariot, and delivered him to safety. Seeing that part of the battle lines beginning to falter, Bhishma raced over to stem the tide. In an explosion of arrows and violence, Devavrata soon put a stop to the Pandava's advance. As luck would have it, the sun set just as the Pandava soldiers were beginning to falter. Only then did Dristed Yumna realize he had survived the ordeal. He and Bhima embraced each other warmly and returned to their camp in good spirits. Well, that's it for Day 6. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 66, Days 7 and 8. Last time, on Day 6, the Pandavas attempted to use the Crocodile Formation, but it worked just about as well as it did for the Karavas on the day before. Perhaps part of the problem was that Bhima did not hold his position. Instead, he saw a group of his cousins on the opposite side and could not resist the temptation to go after them. He abandoned his post and his chariot and lost himself deep in the enemy's midst. Much of the rest of the day's activities centered around attempts at rescuing Bhima from the trap he had flung himself into. Dristed Yumna's rescue attempt resulted in him being trapped alongside his brother-in-law and himself needing rescue. The second rescue attempt was more successful, as Abhimanyu led his half-brothers in a wedge formation that enabled the rest of the Pandava army to follow them through the breach into the enemy lines. He thoroughly terrorized the rank-and-file fighters such that, the following night, he still haunted the survivors' nightmares. Beam also managed to do some real damage to his number one opponent, Duryodhana. The Karva's golden standard had been demolished, and Duryodhana himself was seriously wounded by Bhima's arrows. That evening, back at the camp, Bhishma saw to Duryodhana's wounds. While he was thus treating his injured nephew, Duryodhana asked again why it was that they were struggling to defeat a much less powerful opponent. I guess old Bhishma had given up on changing his nephew's opinions, because he just smiled grimly and said, we do indeed have the best warriors in India fighting on our side, and all of them are ready to give up their lives for your cause. But all that really matters now is that they have Krishna Vasudev on their side, and as long as that remains the case, we cannot possibly succeed. But I have sworn to you my service, and I shall continue to give it my all. I promise, either I will vanquish your enemies, or they shall vanquish me. There shall be no other outcome. As he said this, Bhishma produced a magic salve, which soon healed the prince of the worst of his wounds. For the seventh day's formation, Bhishma chose an atomic model. The soldiers were arrayed in a vast circle, grouped around each of the elephants. For each battle elephant, he assigned seven chariot warriors. To each chariot, he assigned seven horsemen. And to each horseman, he assigned ten archers. And for each archer, there were ten infantry with shields and swords. Yudhishthira's spies quickly informed him of these plans, and after consulting the ancient tomes on warfare, the Dharmaraj selected the Vajram, or Thunderbolt formation. As part of the day's stratagem, a large force managed to draw Arjun away from the main force, and then they surrounded him, alone on his chariot, with only Krishna at his side. They rained arrows, clubs, and spears down on the two Krishnas from all sides. Annoyed, Arjun called to his friend, F*** it, you really want me to kill all these guys? Then watch this. Without waiting for Krishna's approval, Arjun let off one of Indra's own nuclear thunderbolts. The impact was devastating, as the attackers were violently flung to the ground by the force of the explosion. A disheveled and traumatized remnant of survivors went to Bhishma for protection. 
Seeing these injured, frightened mortals appealing to him for protection, Bhishma suddenly became sure of his dharma. He seemed to become larger than life and to put off a blinding glow as he calmly directed his otherworldly white horses toward Arjun's chariot. Something similar happened with his opponents. Krishna and Arjun also began putting off an intense white glow which seemed to absorb the sounds of fighting. Warriors shielded their eyes and scurried out of the way to watch this supernatural encounter. The story breaks away at this very moment to describe the scenes elsewhere in the battlefield. On the opposite end of the field, Drona was pressing in. Commanding that part of the Pandava line was King Virata, and yet another of his sons named Shanka. Remember that the last two of Virata's sons that we met were both killed earlier on. This father and son team dueled with Drona. As you might have noticed by now, these Viratas were not quite equipped for dealing with fighters of Drona's quality, and this encounter was no surprise. Virata attempted to stem Drona's attack on his troops, but the wily Brahmin, with hardly a side glance, shot all four of Virata's horses dead, and sent a fifth arrow right into his driver's forehead. As the remains of his chariot went crashing into the earth, Virata hopped free of the wreckage and climbed onto his son's car. Now father and son, riding a single chariot, set to attacking Drona once again. Drona did not give them much attention. He just sent an arrow flying in their direction and killed Shanka where he stood. This was poor Virata's third son to die in the awful war, and it happened right before the old man's eyes. This was too much for the king. He grabbed the reins, turned the chariot around, and fled. His unfortunate army paid the price, getting slaughtered in droves without a leader. Elsewhere, Drona's son Ashvataman was causing no less trouble. It was Sikandin who tried to fend off this Brahmin boy wonder. Our transvestite hero managed to get in a few good blows. Notching three fletched arrows to his bow, he sent them flying at his opponent where they each pierced through Ashvataman's helm, through the flesh beneath, and embedded themselves into the skull of his forehead. Drona's son looked like he had three horns protruding from his head, like some kind of angry Rishashringa. Well, these Brahmin warriors are a touchy lot, and Ashvataman blew his top. He blew out Sikandin's banner, wheels, weapons, and killed his horse and driver. Sikandin seemed to have already moved on, because he appeared before his opponent on foot, sword and shield in hand. As he approached, Ashvataman fired arrows directly at him, but he parried each of them with his sword. Now Ashvataman took aim at Sikandin's weapon, shattering his shield and breaking the sword in two. Laughing, Sikandin threw the hilt of his sword at his opponent and leapt sideways onto Satyaki's passing chariot. While Sikandin and Ashvataman had been thus preoccupied, Satyaki had been warring with the Rakshasa king Alabusha. The demon had no qualms with using magic against his mortal foes, so Satyaki returned the favor by letting off one of Indra's thunderbolts. Still alive, but now lacking in Shakti power, the creature fled the battle to lick his wounds. Satyaki then moved deep into enemy territory, joyously slaughtering legions of fighters until many of the surviving foot soldiers just ran away from the range of his arrows. King Dhritarashtra interrupted Sanjay at this point. He said, You keep saying that when the warriors on the Pandava's side are fighting, they're always joyous and laughing, but you never say the same thing about the guys on our side. It seems like all I ever hear about my side is that they're getting defeated or feeling dejected and miserable. You aren't being fair. Sanjay said, do not doubt that your champions are doing their utmost to fight on your behalf. But just like the mighty Ganga, though fresh, becomes salty when it encounters the ocean, so does the prowess of your warriors dissipate when they encounter the Pandavas in battle. So do not blame your loyal soldiers, who are expending all their effort on your war. It is because of you and your son that this catastrophic war is broken out. And in any case, these warriors have no fear of death, because to die in battle is to go straight to heaven. Getting back to the fighting, King Shalya of the Madras, whose sister Madri was mother to the twins Nakul and Sahadev, found himself in a duel with his two nephews. Nakul sent a shower of arrows in Shalya's direction, and the king laughed in joy to see his nephew's prowess. He deflected all the arrows that flew at him and sent four shafts in return, each of which killed one of Nakul's horses. Nakul had deftly leapt from his grounded vehicle and joined Sahadev on his chariot. Now the twins stood together on a single car and each fired an arrow at their uncle. One of those two arrows managed to strike their reluctant enemy. The shaft went clear through Shalya's body, causing the king to collapse in his chariot and be driven off the field unconscious. Having defeated the Madra's general, the twins each gave a blast on their horns and proceeded to slaughter the Madra army. 
Arjun's son, Abhimanyu, took on three of Duryodhana's brothers single-handedly and disabled the chariots of all three. But he spared them their lives, remembering that Uncle Bhimasena had a claim on them. Bhishma, surrounded by a vast bodyguard, tried to come to the rescue of the stranded Dhartarastras, but he was waylaid along the way by Arjun, who was glowing white-hot with anger and shakti. Duryodhana had worried about this encounter since the beginning of the war, and he had assigned a vast army to guard Bhishma and keep Arjun at bay. Arjun, of course, was undaunted. He just directed his divine charioteer to drive them right into the enemy's midst. Sanjay said, Then a tremendous battle occurred in which blood was shed like water. Struck by the son of Indra, his opponents collapsed lifeless on the field of battle. Their limbs lacerated, their heads chopped off, their armor and bodies torn apart. Seeing so many noble princes slaughtered, the king of the Trigartas led a counter-strike against Arjun. Tormented by their heavy rain of arrows, Dhananjaya flew into a rage and killed all of his attackers except the king himself. Arjun really had no interest in fighting more duels with these lesser foes. Instead, he pushed on to confront Bhishma directly. Jayadratha, Duryodhana, and Shalya all tried to intervene and distract Arjun from his objective, but the Pandava pushed them aside and stuck to his mission. Arjun's brothers sensed that the big moment might have arrived, and they all rushed to support him. As he hurried to his brother's aid, Yudhishthira saw Sikandin standing around with a broken bow. Since Sikandin was a critical element in their plans to defeat Bhishma, Yudhishthira got annoyed. He hollered at Sikandin, Not long ago, in your father's presence, you swore to me that you would be the first to slaughter Bhishma. But here you are with your thumb up your ass. Do not go back on your oath. Now go out there and fight. This snapped Sikandin out of his stupor, and he grabbed a new bow and rushed to engage with his old nemesis. Unfortunately, Jayadratha got to him first, and the pair were soon engaged in a duel. A small contingent of Duryodhana's brothers, led by the Dhartarastra Chitrasena, charged at the Pandavas, hoping to break their formation. As they drew near, however, Bhima suddenly appeared before them, licking his lips hungrily, club in hand. In a flash, Chitrasena's four horses were smashed by Bhima's club. Chitrasena looked back and saw all his brothers had already run away. Chitrasena swiftly jumped off his wrecked car, turned tail, and ran for safety. I guess Bhishma was once again saved by the bell, because before Arjun and Sikandin were able to get into position, the sun had set, and the fighting ended for the day. The Kauravas chose the formation for the eighth day. This was somehow shaped to represent the sea. In response, the Pandavas arrayed themselves in the shape of an inverted triangle or wedge. In their growing frustration, seven of Duryodhana's more valiant brothers decided to take down Bhima before any more of them could get killed. This turned out to be a mistake. They ambushed Bhima and struck him hard with a number of arrows. But they had also brought themselves into range, and Bhima did not miss this opportunity. In the space of a few minutes, all seven of the bravest Dhartarastras were slaughtered by Bhima Sena. News of their deaths soon reached Duryodhana, and he was crushed with grief. He went to his general Bhishma and said tearfully, My heroic brothers have been slaughtered by that monstrous Pandava, and all my other champions are going the same way, and we can't seem to stop it. Why are you doing this to us? Why do you allow this to happen? You have never favored us, and now you let us die like this. I have made a horrible mistake in putting you in charge. Also weeping, Bhishma said, I told you long ago that this would be the outcome if you persisted with this unwise course. So did Drona, Vidur, and even your own mother warned you, yet you took no notice. So now, since you will not make peace, my advice to you is to fight honorably and fight bravely, so that you may attain paradise when they finally get to you, because the sons of Pandu will never be defeated by us. Meanwhile, the battle continued to rage. On this day, we are introduced to another of Arjun's sons, named Iravat. I do not believe he has been mentioned before, and the story helpfully provides some biographical detail. We are told that Iravat was the son of a Naga woman, Ulupi, whom Arjun had bedded but not wed when he was making his tour of the holy places. See episode 18. When this Naga prince grew older, he sought out his father at Indraloka. There, Iravat met his father for the first time and was also introduced to Indra. Thus blessed, the boy was endowed with magical weapons and became a great warrior. When the allies were summoned for this great battle, Iravat arrived with a contingent of Naga warriors. Sadly, like Setyaki's ten sons, we only meet Iravat long enough to see him die in the battle. The boy tried to take on the demon Alambusha, who happens to be the gentle Rishishringa's son. 
For a while, Iravat held his ground, trading magic spells and weapons with his demonic opponent, but soon he was overcome and killed by Alambusha. Iravat, we hardly knew ye. Bhima's son, Gatokacha, angrily rushed to avenge his cousin's death. Bhima's Rakshasa's son had some potent magic, and he took on Drona, Ashvataman, and Duryodhana all at once. He conjured up a legion of horrifying creatures, and soon the entire Karva army was running in fear and confusion. Taking advantage of the confusion, Bhima managed to kill another ten of his cousins. Once again, the Karvas were saved by the bell. The sun set in the west, and the fighting ended for the day. This is the end of the eighth day of fighting. That evening, while Duryodhana sat in his tent, having his injuries tended to, he summoned his old batch of cronies. Uncle Shakuni, Brother Dushasan, and Karna all gathered to commiserate. Duryodhana complained to his friends. He said, We've got Drona, Bhishma, Kripa, Shalya, all out there, but they can't seem to get the job done. I don't understand why this is so difficult, and I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. We've got to turn this around soon, or we're going to lose this thing. Karna, who was well-rested and eager to fight, said, Don't worry about it. Once I get my chance, I'll turn this thing around in no time. When the son of Shantanu finally gets out of the way, I'll take care of everything. I'll kill the Pandavas and their allies, while Bhishma looks on from the sidelines. Here's what I recommend. Go over to Bhishma's tent and tell him to take a rest. Once that old codger is out of the way, I'll have the heads of the Pandavas lined up as an offering for you. No problem. Wearily, but still wanting to believe his friend, the Karva stood up and commanded Dushasan, saying, Arrange for my escort and retinue. We must pay our uncle a visit. To Karna, he said, I'll persuade Bhishma to retire, and then you may smite our foes in combat. Perhaps unsure exactly of how to go about firing his own elder, Duyodhana had himself cleaned up and adorned in his full regalia, and set out in a litter with a large escort for Bhishma's tent. Bhishma greeted his nephew and provided him the seat of honor. Tearfully, Duryodhana got to the point, sort of. He said, At my behest, you have pacified all of India, and it is well known that you could storm the gates of heaven and succeed. So what then of this little army we have set out to destroy? I remember you promised me that you would wipe out their allies, the Samakas, the Panchalas, the Kakayas, and the Karushas. So when exactly are you planning on doing this? But if you're holding back out of sympathy for them, or hatred for me, then do me a favor, retire. Let Karna enter the fight. I'm certain that he can get the job done. Sorrowfully, Bhishma replied, I see that in your delusion you're blinded to the reality of this situation, so anything I say would seem like excuses. I did indeed swear that I would kill the Samakas and Panchalas. So tomorrow I shall kill them all, or I shall die trying. I will kill them, with the exception of Sikandi. Duryodhana accepted this and returned to his tent. Clearly, the old man was still on probation, but the boy was feeling better. As dawn broke on the following day, he ordered his commanders, Draw up the troops. Today Bhishma shall slaughter the Samakas. Bhishma overheard this and grumbled that he'd rather go straight back to fighting Arjun. Duryodhana knew this perfectly well, so he sent messages to each of his generals, telling them to keep Arjun and Sikandin as far from Bhishma as possible. He told them, if Bhishma is guarded, our victory is certain. On the opposite side, Arjun also had Bhishma on his mind. As the troops were arrayed, he told Dristad Yumna, place Sikandin directly opposite Bhishma. I shall be his protector. That's all for now. Next time, the ninth day of battle begins. Clearly, Bhishma is being pushed into a dangerous corner, but how much longer can he hold out? Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 67. Kurukshetra, Day 9. Last time, we completed the eighth day of the war. The Karvas had put Bhishma in command because he was both the senior Kuru as well as the most renowned fighter. Despite the repeated warnings he got from advisors and sages, Duryodhana pointed his uncle confident that nobody could defeat Bhishma in a fight. This should have been especially true given that they were fighting an inferior force that was led by five young men who had spent the last 13 years starving in the forest like sadhus. But now the battle had dragged on for eight days and the Karva seemed to be slowly losing the war. Duryodhana had lost about 30 of his brothers to Bhima's cudgel, and Bhishma and Drona seemed unable to make headway against their weaker foes. By the end of the eighth day, it was beginning to look like the impossible might happen. Bhishma might in fact lose this war. Karna, like a Hindu Achilles, has been sulking in his tent ever since the battle started, and he too watched the slow defeat with trepidation. Ever boastful and resentful of Bhishma, 
Karna suggested that Duryodhana fire his uncle from the command so that Karna could enter the fight and finish it once and for all. Increasingly frustrated with his uncle's performance and refusing to recognize the significance of Krishna's role in the outcome, Duryodhana suspected his uncle of privately sympathizing with the enemy. On the other hand, he lacked the nerve to actually accuse Bhishma to his face, nor could he bring himself to fire his own uncle. Thus, on the evening of the eighth day, Duryodhana set out to meet with his commander and convince him to resign. By the time he got to Bhishma's tent, however, he found himself unable to do even that. Instead, he whined to his uncle about their failures and asked him when he was going to live up to the oaths he had sworn before the battle started. Specifically, Bhishma had promised to exterminate the entire army of the Samakas and to kill off the Panchali forces. So Duryodhana reminded him of these oaths and timidly suggested that if Bhishma wasn't up to the job, perhaps he'd like to have a rest while Karna takes care of business. A couple of days earlier, Bhishma had glimpsed the door to his salvation. Krishna had grown tired of Arjun's dithering and had gone off to kill Bhishma himself. The old Kuru did not even try to defend himself. If Krishna, in his divine grace, had seen fit to kill him at that moment, Bhishma was more than happy to be relieved of his painful dharma. As it worked out, Bhishma was denied this door to salvation. Perhaps at that moment, however, he realized that his fate was certain, and he must only act out his role in this tragedy until fate finally saw fit to relieve him of these burdens. So possibly with the certitude that his dharma was nearly complete, Bhishma did not take the opportunity to resign or take a rest. Instead, he gave up fighting his nephew and gave up resisting his terrible fate, and instead determined to embrace his bloody dharma and get it over with. Thus, on the morning of the ninth day of the battle, Bhishma declared his intention to fulfill what remained of his oaths. The formations of both armies were more conventional than before. This time, they each consisted of a vanguard at the front with a long rectangular battle line in the rear. As soon as everyone was in position, the two sides charged at each other, scaring the carrion crows and jackals that had been feasting on the remains of the prior day's dead and wounded. Arjun's son Abhimanyu hit the enemy especially hard that morning. He soon led his warriors deep into the enemy territory and was wreaking havoc with their formation. Duryodhana turned to his demon ally, the son of Rishyashringa, called Alambusha. Alambusha had many magic tricks up his sleeve, and he soon broke Abhimanyu's assault and began routing his attackers. Soon, Alambusha had them pressed back to their side of the field and was advancing on the pond of his own line. The five sons of Draupadi all rushed to their cousin's aid, and the six of them finally stopped the demon's assault and soon turned him back. Pierced with arrows on all sides, the demon fell back, but soon he was back again, the arrows removed and ready for revenge. The demon showered the five Draupadeyas with arrows. The boys were unhurt, but their vehicles were all completely incapacitated. Seeing his cousins thus grounded, Abhimanyu came to the rescue. Fighting man to man, the demon soon found himself outmatched by Arjun's son. Once again he was pierced with the boy's golden arrows and felt himself losing consciousness with blood loss. To stop this attack, Alambusha launched a spell of darkness over his opponent. A black cloud descended over this part of the field, making it impossible for Abhimanyu to find his opponent. Abhimanyu was not without some tricks of his own, however, and he summoned a piece of the sun to come to earth and dispel the darkness. Alambusha then resorted to some more magic, but the boy countered all of that and contrived to fire non-magical darts into his foe. Soon, the demon had exhausted all of his power and was reduced to a mere shadow of a wraith, and he fled the field. Without this odious demon to distract him, Abhimanyu resumed his destruction of the enemy fighters. Elsewhere, Bhishma made his first attempt against the Samakas. He showered them with thousands of arrows, killing thousands of fighters. King Drupad, Drusted Yumna, and Sikandin all rode to their defense. Soon they too were beaten back, and then Yudhishthira, Bhim, Satyaki, and the Draupadeyas all had to come to their rescue. Even these heroes' combined strength were unable to get between Bhishma and his dharma. They are all soon enough beaten back while Bhishma resumed his slaughter of the Samakas. Meanwhile, Arjun was inflicting similar damage on King Susharman and his Trigarta army. With Bhishma tied up fulfilling his oath, there was no one to stop Arjun from routing that entire army. The slaughter on both sides reached hideous proportions. Arjun and Bhishma were both a pair of death machines, and the battlefield soon rivaled the most obscene modern-day slaughterhouse. The earth became marshy with congealed blood, while piles and mounds of human flesh were scattered all around. The fighters of both sides were horrified at the spectacle. They began to wonder what was wrong with these accursed Kurus, that they needed to shed so much blood just to settle a question of inheritance between two cousins. Soon enough, the slaughter was more than either side could bear, 
and Duryodhana was compelled to order Bhishma to break off his attack and stop Arjun's assault. Now the battle turned into a duel between Arjun and Bhishma. Arjun's brothers all came up to assist him, while Shalya and some of Duryodhana's brothers rushed to Bhishma's side. While they had stopped the destruction of the Trigartas, they are now back to the old problem of keeping Bhishma away from Arjun. In an effort to relieve Bhishma somewhat, Duryodhana directed 10,000 horsemen to attack Yudhishthira and his brothers. King Shalya led the charge. The cavalry's initial impact was able to break up the brothers, and it was Yudhishthira who led the defense against Shalya's assault. The Pandavas fell back somewhat, but then their line held, and soon the attackers began to falter and then break up. Joyously, the Pandavas slaughtered the majority of these attackers. Shalya countered with the chariot charge, and Bhishma joined in the attack. This time, the damage was immense. Literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers, horses, and elephants were destroyed at their hands, while a whole wing of the Pandava army began to falter. Watching this, Krishna called to Arjuna and said, Arjuna, here's your chance. I recall back in Virata, you told Sanjay that you would kill all of Duryodhana's army and anyone who chose to fight with him, including Bhishma and Drona. Well, here's your chance to make these oaths come true. Remember your dharma and don't worry about anything else. Arjun replied, I shall either go to hell for killing my elders or suffer exile in the forest if I don't. Well, fuck it. Take me to Bhishma and let's do this. When they saw Arjun heading for his confrontation with Bhishma, the Pandavas were heartened once again. They cheered and refused to be beaten back any further. As they came into range, Bhishma showered Arjun and Krishna with arrows. The pair ignored the sting of the blows and then Arjun shot Bhishma's bow into pieces. The old Kuru grabbed a second bow, but it too was instantly struck and shattered by Arjun's bolts. Bhishma praised his nephew's skill, saying, Excellent! Well done, son of Pritha! As he said this, he grabbed a third bow and struck Arjun and Krishna each with his arrows. Much like what happened a few days earlier, Krishna again got annoyed at Arjun's self-imposed impotence. This time he jumped off the chariot unarmed and ran at Bhishma to finish the old man off with his bare hands. And once again, Arjun remorsefully ran after his friend and tried to restrain him. Sanjay said, Vasudev saw that Arjun was fighting half-heartedly, whereas Bhishma wasn't holding anything back. The mighty Madva could not take it any more. Letting go of the reins, Vasudev the yogi leapt down from the chariot and with just his bare hands as his only weapon, charged against Bhishma. His eyes bloodshot with rage, Krishna, the lord of the universe, practically split the earth with his tread as he hurled himself at his foe. Bystanders began wailing, Bhishma is dead. Dressed in yellow silk, his skin a dark sapphire blue, Krishna rushed at his opponent like a lion attacking an elephant. For a second time, Bhishma prepared for his salvation. He said, Come to me now, Govinda, for to be slain by you is to be saved by you. You have honored me, so strike me as you please. My life is yours. But by then, Arjun had caught up with Krishna and was hanging onto his knees trying to slow his charge. As it happened before, Arjun finally got Krishna's attention after being dragged for ten steps. This time, Arjun explained his reason for stopping his friend. He said, Stop, mighty Keshava. Do not go back on your word. You declared that you would not fight. All of this burden is on me alone. I will slay Bhishma. I swear I will. By then, however, the sun had already set on the ninth day. Arjuna's appointment with destiny would have to wait one more day. But of course, the damage was already done. The Samakas had indeed been exterminated or driven from the field as Bhishma had promised, and the Pandavas were greatly worried how they could keep up the fight with such a greatly diminished army. The Kauravas, on the other hand, were jubilant. If Bhishma could keep killing the enemy at this rate, in just a few more days there would be no one left on the other side except the five Pandavas. That night, in a somber mood, the Pandavas held a strategy meeting. Yudhishthira started the proceeding, but immediately turned to Krishna for advice. Sensing their fears and foreboding, Krishna tried to reassure them. He said, Son of Dharma, do not fret. Your brothers are brave and invincible, and if for some reason they are unwilling to fight, then I shall be happy to stand in for them. I shall kill Bhishma on the field of battle while your enemies look on, if Palguna will not do it himself. Whoever is an enemy of yours is an enemy of mine. Your brother Arjuna is my kinsman, friend, and disciple. I would give up my life for Palguna's stake, and I know he would do the same for me. So command me, king, that I may fight. Remember, at Upaplavya, Arjuna swore to kill Bhishma, and his wise vow should be kept. But if he will not do it, then allow me. But you can be sure that if he sets his mind to it, Arjuna shall be able to kill the son of the Ganga. Have no doubt of that. He could kill gods and Dhanavas, so Bhishma would be easy compared to that. 
Besides, Bhishma Shantanava is old, and his energy is spent. His time is nearly up. Yudhishthira answered, You are quite right. Even all of them together could not beat you. I feel sure that we will not fail as long as you are on our side. But what then of Bhishma? I remember all too well of the oath you swore, and I will not be the one to make a liar out of you. So please remain as our advisor and well-wisher, but leave the fighting to the rest of us. You'll recall that Bhishma had once offered to advise me, since he cannot fight for me. I believe that through his advice he shall help us to win. So let's all go to him and ask how we should go about defeating him. But you should know, when we were little children and had lost our father, it was Bhishma who was our mentor and protector. Cursed is the dharma of a Kshatriya who must slay his own venerable elders. Krishna liked this idea, and so the five Pandavas and Krishna, dressed in civilian garb and unarmed, crossed over to Bhishma's tent. Bhishma was delighted to see his beloved nephews. He greeted them joyously and embraced each of them. Yudhishthira was physically pained to have to make this request of his dear grandfather, but being an expert in dharma, he did what he knew he must. He said, All-knowing sir, how can we win this war? How can we regain our kingdom and avoid the loss of so many lives? How can we withstand your attacks, and how can we defeat you? Calmly, even lovingly, Bhishma answered his nephew. He said, My wise Kanteya, as long as I am alive, you cannot be victorious. This is the simple truth. But after I am defeated, then your victory will be assured. So, if you desire victory, then strike me down with my blessing. I consider it your duty and a favor to me if you slay me. So do as I say. As courteously as he could pose such a question, Yudhishthira then asked, Then please tell us how it is that we can defeat you. So far we have been unable to stop you, and it is common knowledge that no mortal can kill you in battle. Bhishma replied, You are correct. So long as I stand armed and battle ready, I can never be defeated, not even by Indra himself. But if I should lay aside my arms, then one of your great warriors will be able to kill me. So let me make this clear. There are certain people whom I will not fight. Those are fallen warriors, fleeing combatants, those who have surrendered to me, women, effeminate men, and the disabled. In addition, I shall not fight if I see any inauspicious sign. Now, among your fighters is Sikandin, Drupada's son. He is a mighty warrior, but he was once a female. You know her story. So let Arjun place her before me and attack me. I shall not strike, even if I am armed and ready. At that moment, Arjun should take advantage of my hesitation and shoot me full of arrows. Do that, and your victory is certain. Do as I say, and you shall smash all of the sons of Dhritarashtra in battle. There was nothing more to be said, so the Pandavas returned to their own camp in a conflicted frame of mind. Arjuna, in particular, was heartbroken. Tearfully, he asked Krishna, How can I kill this man, who is the only father I ever knew? When I was a child, I remember being covered in mud, and I jumped on his lap and called him father. He did not scold me for soiling his clothes. He just laughed and said, I am not your father, but you may call me grandfather. How can I kill that great man? Let him slaughter my troops, because whether it means victory or defeat, I cannot kill the one man who protected us when we were children. Krishna said, O oh, Arjun, there you go again. Remember your oaths. It is his destiny to fall in this battle, and so it shall be. The only question is whether you will be true to your dharma or not. Arjuna paused for a moment and then said, Very well. Clearly, Sikandin is the key to our strategy. We should place him at the head of our forces. I will protect him from the other warriors while he proceeds to combat with Bhishma. Having finally let go of his attachments to the illusion of mortal life, Arjun returned to his tent with the joy and lightness of heart that he had not felt in many years. Clearly, the tenth day of fighting would finally bring about the great confrontation. That's all for now. Next time we'll find out if Arjun has finally overcome his delusions and is truly ready to embrace his dharma. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 68, Kurukshetra Day 10, The Bed of Arrows. Last episode was dedicated to the ninth day of battle and the Pandavas' reaction to the eradication of a significant part of their army. On the evening of the eighth day, Duryodhana had met with Bhishma in his tent to remind him of his oaths to annihilate several of the Pandava armies. At this point, I think Bhishma could see clearly his destiny. He needed to fulfill the last of his promises, and then he could finally be relieved of the burdens of this life. Thus, as much as he did not want to do it, Bhishma accepted his dharma and proceeded to destroy the entire army of the Samakas, who had so courageously taken the side of the righteous against overwhelming odds. On the ninth day, the Samakas were repaid for their loyalty with extermination. At least they were granted direct passage to heaven, since they would never enjoy the fruits of victory. By the end of the ninth day, 
Yudhishthira's army had been greatly reduced in numbers. If they suffered another day of losses like this, there would no longer be enough men to continue the battle. Something needed to change, and quickly. During his war council that evening, Yudhishthira deferred to Krishna's advice. Krishna's suggestion was that Yudhishthira should order him to take up arms, and that he would personally settle the conflict. There was no way Yudhishthira, the Dharma Raja, would allow Krishna to forswear his oath to stay out of the fight, so an alternative was sought. Yudhishthira then recalled Bhishma's offer to advise the Pandavas should they ask for it. Now the path seemed clear. They would ask Bhishma to tell them how to defeat the Karvas. The brothers and Krishna went unarmed to Bhishma's tent and asked him what they should do next. I believe the Pandavas knew full well what it was they needed to do, but after all, it would have been rude to kill Bhishma without first asking for permission. And so, on the evening of the ninth day of the war at Kurukshetra, Bhishma spelled out clearly to his nephews what they must do to be victorious in this struggle. Number one, they must kill Bhishma. The only way to kill Bhishma would be to make him hesitate and lay down his arms. The only way to make Bhishma lay down his arms was to make him fight against a woman. If there were no women available, then a transvestite transsexual would have to do. And so, with their elder's blessing, the Pandavas contrived their strategy for the tenth day of war. Sikandin would go after Bhishma relentlessly, while Arjun would ensure Sikandin's safety. With this plan in mind, the Pandavas prepared for battle at dawn on the tenth day. Sikandin was placed at the front of the army, with Arjun and the other heroes flanking him on either side. On the other side, Bhishma took the foremost position, with Drona and Kripa to back him up, followed by the second tier of fighters. Almost immediately, the Pandavas got the upper hand. The Karva lines began to falter and then began to retreat. Bhishma and Drona responded with a counterattack, and soon the tables returned, and it was the Karavas who were advancing on their enemies. But today was the big day, and this time Sikandin stuck to his duty. He shot three arrows right into the center of Bhishma's chest. Bhishma glared angrily, but then laughed and said, You may strike me down, but I will not fight with you. I know who you are, and that is the little girl you were born as, and I will not fight a girl. Sikandin did not like this slight to his manhood one bit. Angrily, he said, I know all about you, Devavrata. I've heard how you fought against Rama Jamadagni, and I've heard about your occult powers. None of that frightens me. Shoot me or not, I will slay you, so enjoy your final moments on this earth. As those words reached his ears, so also did a barrage of arrows strike Bhishma's armor. Arjun called out to Sikandin, saying, Go for it. Now is the time to finish this. Don't worry about anything else. I will protect you. At this point, Dhritarashtra interrupted the narrative. Perhaps he wanted to put off the terrible news, because he asked Sanjay what was happening elsewhere on the field. So, dutifully, Sanjay backed up and told of events prior to this encounter. He told of a duel between Arjun and Dushasan, and that most evil Karava held his ground surprisingly well. Elsewhere, Alambusha made a comeback and fought with Satyaki, and Abhimanyu struck terror in the hearts of a number of the Karava's noble allies. Yudhishthira, Bhima, Nakul, and Sahadev were all described fighting various Karva heroes, but in none of these duels were there any fatalities. On the Karva side, Guru Drona was a bit distracted. He kept sensing bad omens everywhere he looked. The Brahmin complained to his son Ashvataman, saying, Today's the day Arjun intends to kill Bhishma in battle. I have noticed that my arrows keep sticking together, and my bow is vibrating. My mind is plagued with dark thoughts. The carrion beasts have become aggressive and the sun has lost its luster, and every time Dhananjaya looses an arrow, I can hear the twang of that bowstring. Drona went on, Today is as good a day as any to die, so let's embrace heaven and fight. You take on the Panchalas while I fight Yudhishthira. Bhishma, meanwhile, had already killed his daily quota of 10,000 elephants, 10,000 horsemen, and 10,000 infantry. Surveying the damage he had done to the Pandava's army, the old Kuru was seized with disgust at the needless destruction. Thoroughly sick of the perversion his dharma had become, he decided it was time to move on. Somehow, perhaps telepathically, Bhishma communicated with Yudhishthira from the battlefield. He said, Wise King Yudhishthira, I am done with this life. I am slaughtering countless men, but my time is past. So do me a favor and send me your brother. It is time we did this. Yudhishthira heard this and did not hesitate. He rode out to his generals and brothers and ordered them to attack Bhishma with all their strength. The Dharma Raja said, Attack! Now is the time to defeat Bhishma. Remember your oaths and do not fear, because you are protected by Arjun, Bhima, and Dristad Yumna. At his word, the heroes of the Pandava army all fell into the formation they had agreed to on the night before, with Sikandin leading the charge. By now it was clear to the Karavas what was being attempted. 
So Drona, Krepa, Ashvataman, Dushasan, and his brothers all rushed to protect Bhishma at all costs. The Pandavas were also ready for this, and each of their greatest fighters took on their appointed opponent. Satyaki fought Ashvataman, Abhimanyu fought Dushasan and his brothers, Virata fought Jayadratha of Sindh, Yudhishthira fought Shalya, and Bhim went to work on the enemy's elephants. These Karavas knew they were being distracted from their assigned objective, but there was no way they could safely break free and return to Bhishma's side. Thus, Sikandin and Arjun were able to confront Bhishma directly. Sanjay said the ferocity of this encounter caused the earth to shake all across the field of Kurukshetra. In the shifting tides of men and horses and elephants, Arjun suddenly saw an opening. Straight ahead stood Bhishma, exposed. He ordered Sikandin to attack the old man at all costs. But before they could react, the pair was nearly bowled over by a herd of maddened elephants, led by King Bhagadatta. Arjun was not going to let mere elephants get in his way at this critical juncture. He fired arrows of such weight and size that a single one was all that was required to kill a grown elephant. The attack had pushed them back somewhat, but after the dust had cleared, they found they were even closer to Bhishma than before. At this point, Sikandin needed no further encouragement. He took aim and fired a dozen arrows at his ancient enemy, all of which struck home. Bhishma was not used to this sort of treatment and automatically, instinctively, he became incandescent with rage. He summoned to mind a devastating spell, which launched iron arrows in all directions. The projectiles flew through the bodies of the fighters all around him, and suddenly Bhishma stood alone in the field, glowing white-hot, surrounded by the dead and dying warriors. In that part of the field, only Arjun and Sikandin survived the explosion. Arjun survived by countering the spell and defending himself, while well, Sikandin was protected by her sexual identity, which Bhishma wanted nothing to do with. The result of Bhishma's explosion was ultimately to clear the field, and it gave Sikandin a clear shot at his opponent. He struck Bhishma with ten arrows, all in the chest. The old son of the Ganga just glared at Sikandin, as if his gaze alone might incinerate her, but he didn't do it. Perhaps considering the enormity of what he was about to do, Sikandin stopped and returned Bhishma's gaze. I wonder if... Had Bhishma not made that ill-advised oath never to wed, he and Amba were supposed to have been married to each other, and perhaps it was this lost opportunity that haunted Sikandin's thoughts at this very moment. Arjun had to snap her out of it. He said, why are you just standing there? Quickly, kill him now. Let's get this over with. That was enough to get her head back in the fight, and Sikandin loosed another flurry of arrows at Bhishma. This time Bhishma contained himself and only focused his attention on Arjun. Thus, as he was struck again and again by Sikandin's arrows, he did not try to defend himself on that front, and only continued to fire volleys of arrows at other fighters. Then Bhishma faltered. He sank to one knee, plucking arrows from his armor and trying to catch his breath. The Karvas were all shocked at the sight, but it was Dushasan who broke past the Pandavas and charged his uncle's attackers. Automatically, Bhishma covered for his prodigal nephew as Dushasan tried to stop Sikandin from her deadly mission. But Arjun was there to protect her, and despite Dushasan's reckless assault, he repulsed each attack while simultaneously defending Sikandin and attacking Bhishma. By now, Sikandin's arrows were taking their toll. But Sanjay says that Bhishma felt no pain. He said, Bhishma received these wounds with a smile. Like a thirsty man welcomes the rain, so did the son of Ganga receive the torrents of Sikandin's arrows. Things were getting desperate for the Karavas. Duryodhana summoned all his generals and ordered them all to fight as one to rescue Bhishma, regardless of the cost. And so, in one desperate last-ditch attempt, all the Karava luminaries joined together and made a massive assault on Bhishma's tormentors. Arjun, however, rose to the challenge. He seemed to grow bigger and appeared in many places at once, his arrows preventing even the combined efforts of all of his enemies from getting anywhere near Sikandin or Bhishma. Arjun fought like a god come down to earth, and no one could resist his attack. Bhishma made one last effort to conjure one of his magic missiles, but Sikandin shot it out of his hands before he could set it off. Now Arjun joined in and shot out Bhishma's bow. Before he could reach for his second bow, it had already been shattered by Arjun's arrows. Smiling grimly, Bhishma picked up a spear and hurled it at his nephew, but it too was shattered before it could reach its target. Now Bhishma became thoughtful. He considered, I could have won this war days ago if the other side was not protected by Krishna. It is clearly pointless to keep this up. Long ago my father blessed me with two boons, that I may never be killed in battle, and that I may choose the time of my death. I think the proper time for my death is now at hand. The moment Bhishma resolved to die, time seemed to slow down for him. All his aches and pains left him, 
and he heard a kindly voice say, Well done, Devavrata. Your time here has come to an end. Withdraw your mind from this battle. Release your attachments and let go. At first he could not make out who was speaking to him, but he felt a familiar presence. Soon he saw them, seven beautiful young men, their hearts full of love beckoning to him. Then he remembered. These were his brothers. They were not the ghosts of Vichitravirya nor Trichangara, the sons of Shantanu. No, these were his spirit brothers, the seven Vasus, who had been set free by his mother Ganga the moment they were born. He knew then that it was time to go home. He had played his part magnificently, but now it was time to exit the stage and take a long-deserved rest. While this was happening, Bhishma was struck again and again by Sikandin's arrows. He took no notice of them, but the next barrage had a real sting to them. These were Arjun's bolts. Bhishma's resolve had spread a senseless terror among the Karavas, and the animals and foot soldiers began to panic and run blindly in all directions. The Karava heroes, meanwhile, resisted the urge to run away, and, their faces streaming with tears, they continued their futile push to rescue the mighty Gangaputra. But, as if a spell had been cast on them, they seemed to lose all their vigor, and Yudhishthira and his allies were able to keep them all at bay. Now Arjun was free to focus on his main target. As if possessed, he fired a relentless torrent of arrows at Bhishma. Even as Bhishma fell again to one knee, he did not pause. He sent arrow after arrow into his grandfather's body, until Bhishma finally tumbled off the chariot and fell to the earth. Even the gods and rishis gasped at the sight of such a great man falling to the ground. Arjun did not stop firing his arrows, however, and such were the number of arrows stuck into Bhishma's body that they actually suspended him off the ground, sparing this great man the defilement of touching the dirt of the battlefield. Everyone on both sides of the conflict were screaming and crying in despair at the spectacle. The earth shook and the heavens let loose a sudden downpour of rain. Of course, the fighting could not go on. Both sides seemed dazed, as if something had changed about the world, and it would never be the same again. The Karvas all wept and wailed, and it became apparent, to some for the first time, that they might actually lose this war. Bhishma may have fallen, but he was not dead. As he lay on his bed of arrows, he considered that it was inauspicious to die in the autumn when the sun was on its southward journey. Calling on his father's gift, he set his mind on remaining alive, albeit deep in meditation, until after the winter solstice, when the sun would resume its northward course, keeping its promise of the new life of spring. Tearing off their armor and dropping their weapons to the ground, the combatants forgot their struggle and rushed to Bhishma, where he lay. The sons of Dhritarashtra and the sons of Pandu all gathered around their ancestor and knelt, weeping. The loss was too much for Drona, who temporarily lost his mind and even passed out in shock. As the vast Kuru clan gathered around their fallen protector, Bhishma took a breath, he blinked his eyes and said, Greetings, my children, I am pleased to see you. Suspended as he was on the arrows that pierced his body, Bhishma's head lolled around. His nephew scurried to find a fitting cushion to hold up his head, but Bhishma demurred. He said, These pillows are not fitting for my bed. Addressing Arjun, he said, Mighty Dhananjaya, please provide me with a suitable pillow. His eyes streaming with tears, Arjun strung his Gandava bow, whispered to it some purifying incantations, and then launched three arrows, which contrived to land in such a way that they propped up Bhishma's weary head. Bhishma praised his favorite, saying, A bed of arrows on a battlefield is a fine resting place for a true Kshatriya. By this time, a team of physicians had arrived, ready to remove the shafts and heal his wounds, but Bhishma sent them away. He said, I have no use for healers now. I have reached the noblest state of a Kshatriya's dharma. What better honor than to die like this on the battlefield? I shall be cremated with these arrows still in my body. A ditch was dug around the place where Bhishma fell, and an honor guard of kings placed themselves around him to stand watch night and day. The countless camp followers, footmen, and officers all crowded around Bhishma to pay their respects, and thousands of garlands were laid around him. The combatants seemed to have forgotten all their old grievances, and they commingled as if there were no Pandavas and no Karvas, just one big clan gathered to honor their venerable ancestor. As evening drew near, Bhishma began to suffer from the pain of his many injuries. The attentive women around him offered him water, but Bhishma rejected them. He declared, I no longer consider myself among the world of the living, so it is no longer possible to accept sustenance from I have renounced the society of men. Send me Arjun. Arjun rushed to his uncle's side and knelt before him. Bhishma said, Covered as I am with your arrows, my body burns and my mouth is parched. Only you can give me water in the proper fashion. Grimly, Arjun said, So be it. 
he mounted his chariot and strung his bow. Respectfully, he drove the chariot in a circle around Bhishma, drew a single gleaming arrow, and fired it into the earth near Bhishma's head. With a thunderclap, the arrow penetrated the earth and disappeared into its depths. And then, a fine stream of pure ambrosial water sprang from the same spot, and Bhishma was able to drink from that sacred fountain. The bystanders were all astonished by this amazing feat. It was something they had only thought gods like Indra were capable of. Bhishma noticed their surprise and admonished Duryodhana. He said, This really should come as no surprise to you by now. Haven't I told you repeatedly that Arjun is the incarnation of the primeval lord Nara? To those who recognize him, he is the exterminator of the Kshatriyas. And with Vasudeva at his side, he shall never be defeated. Although you never listened to me before, pay attention now. Give up this hopeless struggle while some of your brothers yet live. Sanjay said, The famous son of the river Ganga said these words to Duryodhana, and then he fell silent. His vital organs tormented by arrows, he overcame his pain by deep meditation. That's all for now. Next time, we'll finish up the Bhishma Parva as Karna rushes to Bhishma's side and the pair of them clear the air. Then, we're on to the next book called the Drona Parva. The war must go on. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 69, Kurukshetra, Days 11 and 12, The Drona Parva. I must admit, last episode was the toughest one I've had to cover so far. I can't help but feel a little emotional about Bhishma's downfall at the hands of someone who loved and respected him so dearly. It really has to be one of the most powerful and moving scenes out of any work of literature, not to mention that this also happens to be one of the oldest works of literature as well. Be that as it may, everything happened just as it needed to happen. Bhishma had fulfilled his oaths, and all that remained of his dharma was to die in a way fitting for the world's greatest kshatriya, on a bed of arrows. Never being one for taking the easy way out, Bhishma dutifully accepted his doom, but refused to leave this world until the astrological time was right. Calling on the boon he had earned with his oath not to marry, Bhishma declared his intention to remain living on his bed of arrows until the sun resumed its northward journey at the winter solstice, at which time his tortuous bed would become his funeral pyre. In the meantime, a protective trench was dug around his resting place, and an honor guard of kings were placed around him at all times. Although he had refused to leave his body, Bhishma had already renounced the comforts of the living. Thus, none could tend to his wounds, offer him food or water. The only comfort he allowed was to have Arjun conjure a spring of heavenly water to quench his thirst. Later that night, when things had settled down somewhat, Karna emerged from his tent and presented himself to the Kuru patriarch. Sanjay says that Karna went to his rival not without some trepidation. When he caught sight of that great man, impaled by Arjun's long arrows, he choked up. With tears in his eyes, he said, O oh Bhishma, it is I, Radha's son, Karna, who always saw disgust in your eyes whenever he came to your presence. Slowly, Bhishma opened his eyes. Recognizing Karna there, he dismissed his guards. When everyone was out of hearing range, Bhishma embraced Karna with one arm like a father embraces his son. Speaking with great affection, he said, Come here, my dear rival. I'm glad you have come to me. But you are not Radha's son, nor is Adirata the Sutta your father. Mighty hero, the sun god is your father. Narada and Vyasa have both told me your story. I feel no hatred for you, my son. I used to speak harshly to you, but it was only to prevent you from compounding your mistakes. It was wrong of you to revile your brothers, the Pandavas. But tragically, you were born illegitimately, and by staying in the company of wicked men, it made you malicious even to the virtuous. That is why I often said harsh words to you in the court of the Kurus. I have not failed to notice that your prowess in battle is unrivaled among mortal combatants. I have admired your valor, loyalty, and generosity. I only spoke harsh words to you out of fear that you might do something unlawful to your own brothers. You are generous to Brahmins, the child of a god, and invincible in battle. Any grudge I may have had in the past is now gone. But the Pandavas are your blood brothers. If you wish to honor me, then unite with them. Son of Surya, let this enmity cease with my death, and let all the kings of the earth enjoy peace. Karna replied, I do not doubt that all you say is true, but although I am Kunti's son, she left me to die, and I was only saved by a Sutta's wife. It was Duryodhana who recognized my abilities, and I owe him everything. My wife, my sons, my wealth, and even my life all belong to him. I have already renounced all these things for Duryodhana's sake. It is not fitting for a warrior to die of old age. This conflict was inevitable, and there is no point in trying to avert it. I know perfectly well that the Pandavas and Vasudeva are invincible, but it is my duty to fight them and defeat them if I can. 
I intend to fight Dhananjaya according to my dharma, and I will do it joyfully. My mind is made up, so with your blessing, allow me to enter the fight. But if, out of impetuosity or insolence, I have offended you, then please forgive me. Bhishma said, Very well, if you cannot renounce this bitter feud, then fight with my blessing. Fight, and may you find your salvation by fighting, free of attachments. Perform your duty to the best of your ability. Free yourself of anger and arrogance, and may you find what you desire in that. Through Dhananjaya may you attain paradise on the field of battle, for there is no better fate for a true warrior. Bhishma paused then, and after a few minutes' silence, he said, Karna, for so long I have made great efforts to achieve peace, but it could not be done, I tell you truthfully. No more was said between the two. Karna just rose and walked back to Duryodhana's tent. This ends the sixth book of the Mahabharata, called the Bhishma Parva. The Bhishma Parva is also known as the first of the battle books of the Mahabharata. Each of these books is named after the Karva general in charge during that period of the war. Now that Bhishma is out of the fight and waiting for death, it is time for a new commander. Thus, our next book is named after the new general. It is called the Drona Parva. In case you've lost track in the course of all this bloodshed, it is worth remembering that the tale of the Great War is conveyed as a conversation between blind king Dhritarashtra and his charioteer Sanjay. Sanjay has been granted divine sight by the sage Vyasa, and thus he is reporting the story as he sees it occurring out on the battlefield. The Drona Parva opens with Dhritarashtra's reaction to the news of Bhishma's downfall. It says that the blind king was plunged into sorrow and anxiety for his sons, but despite this, he still harbored dreams that they might yet win this conflict. Dhritarashtra asks Sanjay how each side reacted to the fall of Bhishma. Sanjay replied that the Pandavas paid due respects to their uncle in a solemn and reverential state of mind, but by morning of the next day, their minds turned once again to the conflict that was yet to be settled. As for the Karavas, Sanjay says they were completely shattered by the demise of their leader. They felt as if on the verge of an abyss, but then their thoughts turned to Karna. They considered his ability and his past accomplishments, and they felt their confidence returning. Karna was summoned, and he showed up riding on an enormous war chariot, armed and outfitted for war. The sight of Karna, moving like a ponderous war machine, reassured Duryodhana immensely. The Karva king asked for Karna's advice on how they should proceed. Karna recommended that Drona be made their new commander, and Duryodhana readily agreed. Before agreeing to take on this responsibility, Drona wanted to make sure they were aware of the limits of his abilities. He said, As you say, I am indeed skilled in the use of every weapon, and I fear no man, but you should know that there is one man among the Pandavas whom I cannot kill. He is Dristad Yumna, Drupad's son, and he was born to end my life. As for the rest of them, I'll kill them all until there is only him and the five Pandavas left alive. This was good enough for Duryodhana. Happily, he had Drona anointed as their commander-in-chief, and the warriors prepared for the eleventh day of battle. When Karna appeared in the field by Drona's side, fighters on both sides felt it was as if Bhishma had never been defeated. Soon enough, the battle was resumed for the eleventh day. Sanjay described the usual litany of destruction and death, and this time it was Drona's turn to sow chaos among the Pandava's allies. As we've heard many times before, Drona killed countless warriors as Arjun did similar damage to his opponents. At this point, it seems even Sanjay got bored of describing the endless violence, because his story trailed off, and then he pronounced, My king, on that day, Drona was like the sun come down to earth and set everything alight that he touched. But now he is in heaven. His victims were innumerable, but Drona finally fell at Dristad Yumna's hand. Dhritarashtra had probably expected another endless account of unnamed warriors being killed, so the news of his preceptor's death deeply unsettled him. The blind king said, That's impossible. You're saying the greatest warrior that ever lived was slain by a mob of Pandavas and Shirinjayas? The old king became so upset that Sanjay worried for his life. Dhritarashtra fell out of his chair in a faint, and doctors were summoned to revive the old man. When Dhritarashtra was finally brought back to consciousness, he said to Sanjay, With the death of Bhishma and of Drona, all my hard-earned wealth shall pass to Yudhishthira. Disaster has overtaken our clan. Even so, I wish to hear exactly what happened. Sanjay said, Very well then, let me tell you what I saw of how Drona was killed on the field of battle. With that, Sanjay's narrative returned back to the morning of the eleventh day, as the Karavas were preparing for battle. As the new commander, Drona, asked Duryodhana what his overall strategy for the day should be, Duryodhana said, If you wish to prove your worthiness as my commander, then I ask this one favor. Bring me their king, Yudhishthira, alive. Drona said, Really? I'm glad to hear it. 
So I take it you mean to capture him, so you might return to him what rightfully belongs to him. Duryodhana said, Don't be ridiculous. Of course not. The reason we must capture him alive is that should Yudhishthira be killed, there's no telling what Arjun will do. Without a doubt, he would, if necessary, tear down the fabric of space and time to avenge his brother. No, if we stand any chance against him, we must first capture his elder brother. Once we've got a hold of Yudhishthira, we'll arrange another dice game, and he and his brothers shall meekly return to the forest where they belong. Drona's hopes had momentarily risen, but then came crashing down when he learned of the Karva's sneaky plan. Drona said, Very well then, consider Yudhishthira as good as captured. But this will only be possible if we can somehow distract Arjun, or get him out of the way, because, as you say, even the gods and Asuras could not stand against him, and I for one will not even try. It is true that he was once my student, but he is without question my superior at arms. He may be young, but his training and accomplishments are unrivaled in all the world. Plus, his arsenal of magic weapons exceeds even Indra and Shiva. Besides, his anger at you is such that I will not be able to stop him. But if Arjun can somehow be driven away or distracted, then we have a good chance at capturing his eldest brother. Drona concluded, saying, I can assure you, if you can get Arjuna out of the way for just a little while, then I will capture the King of Righteousness, and he will be yours to command. But if Arjuna is anywhere near his brothers, then forget it. Not even a legion of Indras could do it. Sanjay says that it wasn't long after that, spies reported the whole plan to the King of the Pandavas. When Yudhishthira heard it, he spoke to Arjun, saying, Well, my brother, you've heard what they plan to do, but their plan has an obvious flaw, and that flaw is you. If you can just stay by my side, we shall deny them their objective. Arjuna assured his brother that he had nothing to fear. He said, Our old teacher cannot defeat me, and I will not desert you. As long as I live, Drona shall not take you as his prisoner. Not long after, the fighting began. I'll spare you all the details, as they tend to run together after a while, and I think you've gotten a good taste of it in the past days of battle. One exceptional moment came when Jayadratha attacked Abhimanyu. At one point, they were both dismounted, and the king of Sindh brought his broadsword smashing down on Arjuna's son. Abhimanyu raised his shield, and the sword shattered when it struck. Disarmed, Jayadratha retreated, but Shalya covered for him by flinging an iron spear at the boy warrior. In a single motion, Abhimanyu sheathed his sword, grabbed the spear out of the air, spun it around, and sent it flying back at his opponent, killing Shalya's driver. His uncles and cousins all cheered at this amazing feat. As the day drew to a close, Drona launched a major assault on the Pandavas, hoping to make good his promise as quickly as possible. The Brahmin sowed chaos and death among the Pandavas, and soon he was just a few feet from his quarry, Yudhishthira. Drona knocked Yudhishthira from his chariot, and the bystanders thought this must be the end of the fight. But before Drona could pull the Pandava out of his cart, Arjun came crashing down on him. The ferocity of Arjun's attack scattered his brother's attackers and threw Drona on the defensive. As the day turned to night, Drona was reduced to trying to keep his soldiers from running away. The Pandavas returned to camp in high spirits, but on the Karava side, Drona was feeling pretty hopeless. He complained to Duryodhana that he'd never achieved their mission so long as Arjuna was on the loose. The Karavas and their allies all sat there silently a while, lost in a deep funk, when finally Susharman, king of the Trigartas, spoke up. He said, My warriors are getting tired of feeling the sting of Arjun's arrows. It seems we are doomed to die at his hands regardless, so let us make this sacrifice. Allow me and my brothers to lead the offensive to drive Arjun away from his brothers. Whether we succeed or fail, we do not expect to get out of this alive, but we shall embrace heaven and will do it anyway. And so, Susharman and his brothers, along with their entire army of the Trigartas, all made a vow to drive Arjun off the field and to embrace their inevitable death in the process. So that night, a great big funeral pyre was prepared, and each of the soldiers was anointed and blessed by priests. They each swore to kill Arjuna or die trying, and gave away all their possessions in preparation for this final effort. The following morning, as the troops were being arrayed, the Pandavas noticed that a large chunk of the Karva army had headed off the field to a separate location. Heralds were sent over who announced that the Trigartas had sworn an oath to kill Arjun or die trying, and that they had issued a challenge to him. When Arjun heard this, he turned to Yudhishthira and said, My king, you know that I cannot turn down a challenge. Please allow me to crush them. At least by the time I'm done with them, you have a lot less enemies to worry about. Yudhishthira said, Well, you know perfectly well what Drona has in mind. I know you're a great warrior, but Drona's no slouch either. Arjun reassured his brother, saying, You will be well guarded by Drista Dyumna. He was born to kill Drona. 
At that, Yudhishthira gave his brother his blessing, and Arjun set out to kill the vast army of the Trigartas. For Arjun, killing the individual Trigartas was like shooting fish in a barrel. The only problem was that there were so many of them. Perhaps for entertainment, Arjuna loosed one of his magic weapons. This one cast confusion on the enemy and made them think everyone was Arjun. Each attacked the Arjun at hand, but in reality they were all attacking each other. Meanwhile, Drona was wreaking havoc among the rest of the Pandavas. The description of the fighting that day runs to nearly 200 pages in my book. A lot of it involves peripheral characters whom we've never heard of, plus the requisite feats of our lesser heroes, such as Nakul and Sahadev, and the five sons of Draupadi, etc. At one point, Drona had the Pandavas hard-pressed. They were all crowded together and were being attacked on all sides when Bhima Sena led a counter-strike. He burst through the enemy lines and scattered the attackers. Soon he had zeroed in on Duryodhana. While the pair fought, Bhim destroyed the Karva's snake banner and smashed his bow. A barbarian king named Anga came to the rescue, astride a mountainous elephant. While the beast charged, Bhim grabbed an arrow, and when the beast was up close, he drove it into the elephant's eye, killing it instantly. For good measure, he beheaded Anga before he even reached the ground. More elephants came charging in, and soon Bhim was lost in a sea of elephants. When nothing was seen of Bhim for a while, people began saying that he must have been killed. King Bhagadatta, meanwhile, was astride a giant elephant that must have been the size of a mastodon, because with one foot the creature smashed Nakul's chariot. Bhagadatta led an entire herd of these beasts, directing them all with an iron-tipped goad that had an uncanny influence on them. Arjun could hear the ground shaking with their charge, and he suddenly grew worried. He knew King Bhagadatta could only be stopped by him, but it meant breaking off with the Trigartas. As he paused to consider this, the Trigartas all stuck their tongues out at him and mocked him for hesitating before a challenge. Arjun considered this a while, and then, feeling like he was being pulled into two pieces, he turned back to fight with the Trigartas. Sanjay said, This was exactly what Duryodhana was hoping for. By choosing to remain fighting the Trigartas, Arjun had sprung their trap. The Trigartas soon paid for their taunts with tremendous slaughter. Even Krishna was impressed with Arjuna's brutality. The Trigartas soon paid for their taunts with tremendous slaughter. Even Krishna was impressed with Arjuna's brutality. His voice full of wonder, he said, This would even test the strength of Yama or Indra. Indeed, Arjun soon had the greater part of the Trigartas dead on the field. His enemies thus beaten back and traumatized, Arjun said to Krishna, Enough of this for now. Take me to King Bhagadatta. At this point, a major part of the Pandava's wing was crumbling under the combined assault of Drona and Bhagadatta's elephants. Arjuna raced over to the scene when he saw the vast destruction that Bhagadatta's elephants had done to his friends and allies. Taking his time, he slowly picked his enemy to pieces with his arrows. First, he shot out all of his weapons, then used his arrows to dismantle Bhagadatta's armor. When the king was thus stripped of his defenses, Arjuna shot the crown off his head. Arjuna filled Bhagadatta's body with his arrows. But the king did not fall. Instead, he muttered an incarnation to his magic goad. It turns out that this goad was in reality the divine Vaishnava weapon. As his final act, King Bhagadatta fired this at his opponent. It is said that no one can withstand the blow of the Vaishnava weapon. But just before it struck Arjun, Krishna stood up and received the blow full in the chest. The weapon struck him and was consumed by him in a blinding light. Krishna glowed brilliantly for a while, but was otherwise unhurt. Krishna took a moment to explain what had happened. He said the weapon had originally belonged to him, but at one time the Earth Mother had asked for it as a gift for her son Narika. Somehow Bhagadatta had gotten it from Narika, so Krishna had merely taken his own weapon back. He commanded Arjun, That weapon is no longer his, so kill him now. He is a super asura, an arch demon. Rid the world of him. Arjuna did not hesitate. He fired an arrow into the elephant's head, and as it crashed to the ground, he shot a second arrow through Bhagadatta's head, killing him. Sanjay says, A hot wind blew through the car of his army when he died. This king, also known as Pragyotisha, had been a drinking buddy of Indra's. Out of respect for his father's friend, Arjun circled his corpse three times. At this moment, we learn that Duryodhana's uncle Shakuni had two brothers. This pair of princes tried to avenge Bhagadatta, but a single arrow from Arjun's bow went clear through both of the brothers as they charged him. Shakuni tried to avenge them by casting some spells. The first spell animated all the fallen weapons on the battlefield and sent them hurtling at Arjun, but Arjun shot them all out of the air. Shakuni's second spell cast darkness over Arjun's chariot, 
but he had a remedy for that as well, in the form of an arrow that brought the light of the sun to earth. That was enough for Shikuni. After his tricks failed, he ran away. Shikuni wasn't the only one to run away. By now, most of their ranks were broken and fleeing Arjuna's arrows. As happened so many times before, the Karvas managed to solidify their lines and counterattacked. This time, Drusted Yumna dueled with Drona while Arjun fought with Karna. Like Shikuni, we are told that Karna had at least three brothers fighting at his side. We barely meet these fellows, and then Arjun killed all three. Before either of these encounters could be concluded, the sun set, ending the twelfth day of the war. So far, the Karva's plan to kidnap Yudhishthira has failed, but Drona still lives. Thirteen is an unlucky number here in the West. Next time, we'll see what kind of luck it brings to the Pandavas on day 13. Thanks for listening. This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 70, Kurukshetra Day 13, The Death of Abhimanyu. Last time, the Karvas responded to the fall of Bhishma by appointing their former arms instructor, the Brahmin Drona, to be their new commander-in-chief. Before the fighting really got started, Sanjay suddenly announced that Drona was killed. It turned out that this was jumping ahead a few days, because when he got down to describing Drona's death in detail, we found out that at least two full days of fighting took place with Drona in command, and he's still perfectly alive. Drona's objective for the past two days was to capture Yudhishthira alive. Duryodhana's plan was to avoid Arjun's vengeance by capturing Yudhishthira, gambling with him some more, and sending them back to their old haunts in the forest. They failed to capture Yudhishthira because Arjun kept intervening and driving off the would-be kidnappers. The Karvas tried to rectify this on the twelfth day by sending a large portion of their army on a suicide mission. The Trigartas volunteered to challenge Arjun to a separate duel where they would distract him while Drona captured Yudhishthira. But somehow Arjun managed to both meet the challenge, slaughter half the Trigartas, and still made it back in time to protect his brother. So now, on the morning of the thirteenth day, the Karvas were desperate for a new plan. One half of the Trigartas remained alive, so they would continue on with the job of distracting Arjun, but Drona needed to step up his game. Sanjay says that Duryodhana was furious at the failure of his plans, but he tried to remain polite as he spoke with Drona. He said, I must be missing something here. I have seen you fight all kinds of heroes, and you always defeated them. But yesterday I saw you within inches of grabbing Yudhishthira, but somehow you couldn't take him. It makes me wonder how serious you are about this mission. Do you truly intend to capture him? Dorna was deeply shamed by his master's lack of confidence. He said, I thought you would have had more faith in me than that. You should know by now that as long as he is protected by Krishna and Arjun, we cannot touch him. But never fear, we shall again distract them with our suicide squad. And I shall array our forces such that not even the gods could breach it. Dorna then organized their army in the shape of a vast wheel, with princes holding the positions of the spokes and Drona at the front. With Arjuna busy elsewhere, Yudhishthira led the charge against Drona's formation, but he and his remaining brothers were easily beaten back. Durasid Yumna, Setyaki, Gatokacha, and all their allies were unable to breach Drona's formation, and they were all beaten back. In desperation, Yudhishthira summoned his heroic nephew Abhimanyu, Arjuna's son. He said to the boy, Only you, Krishna and Arjun, can breach this car of a wheel. But your uncles cannot help us now, so this leaves only you who can save us. Abhimanyu replied, Victory for my fathers is all I desire. My father taught me the secret for destroying this formation. But I am afraid that if something goes wrong, I might not be able to get out again. Yudhishthira said, You just break through, and we will follow in behind you. So you just worry about your objective, and we will take care of the rest. Bhim, Setyaki, and Drusid Yumna all pledged to stay at the boy's side as he made this maneuver. Abhimanyu called to his charioteer, Drive on, Sumitra. Take me to Drone's formation. The Sutta Sumitra wasn't so confident as his master. He said, Your uncles have laid a heavy burden on your young shoulders. Please consider. Drona taught you everything. He is an expert in war, and you do not have his experience. Abhimanyu laughed at this. He said, Who do you think he is? Even if you are greater than Indra and the whole host of gods, I would face him and hold my ground. You can be sure that even if I faced Vishnu, who cannot be defeated, still I would not be afraid. With that, the pair led the charge against Drona's impenetrable formation. The boy smashed into the enemy, with his uncles following behind, scattering Karva heroes as he went. Once again, many pages are filled with the heroic antics of Arjuna's famous son, but you've heard plenty of this already, so I'll skip ahead. Basically, Abhimanyu shattered Drona's wheel formation, and the warriors on both sides were amazed. As the boy warrior dueled with one or another Karva, the others all oohed and awed at his heroics. 
In amazement, Drona said, Wow, how proud his uncles must be to see him covered in such glory. It is strange that he hasn't already defeated us all. Unfortunately, Duryodhana overheard him saying this, and he blew his top. He said, How nice. My commander is in love with our biggest enemy. How many of our kings and princes have been killed because you are holding back? And everyone thinks Abhimanyu survives by his own valor. Now stop wasting time and crush him. Dushasan, always eager to please his older brother, said, Let me be the one who kills him. When Arjun and Krishna hear of Abhimanyu's death, they too will die of sorrow and shame. Dushasan then charged at the boy wonder, who deftly parried each of his attacks. Abhimanyu taunted his cousin, saying, I know this proud hero. I recall his rude speech and his insults. Come to me now so I may punish you for having insulted King Yudhishthira and stealing his kingdom. For your lawless passion, your greed, treachery, and violence, come out now and reap your terrible reward. Dushasan made one more attack and received a body full of arrows. Knocked flat and bleeding, his driver carried him off the field. Karna then produced two of his brothers, both unnamed, and the three of them all attacked young Abhimanyu. The boy first disabled Karna, then beheaded both of his brothers. As Karna was hauled away unconscious, Abhimanyu broke their ranks and entered deep into the enemy's formation, leaving his kinsmen far behind in the process. While his opponents all suffered dearly, Abhimanyu was not without injuries of his own. He had arrows sticking out of his armor on all sides, and the heads dug into his flesh, but he was too energized to notice. Sanjay told Dhritarashtra, The cries of his countless noble victims combined into a grim chorus that struck terror into our hearts. But Subhadra's son continued to rage through his foes like fire consuming a forest of dead trees, until he approached the very center of the formation. He appeared here, then there, and in seconds he wheeled through every point in the compass. For a moment I glimpsed him once again, risen like the midday sun. Son of the son of Indra, Indra he became. That day, in the heat of the fray, Abhimanyu blazed, and hot were the fires in which his enemies burned. Abhimanyu then killed Shalya's eldest son and heir. He also killed Duryodhana's son, Lakshman. Growing desperate, Karna said to Drona, We can't hold out much longer. Tell us how to beat this boy. Drona thought a while, and then said, Mounted with the bow in his hand, he cannot be beaten by man nor God. But take away his bow and his wheels, and you will stop him. These seasoned warriors realized that they needed a stratagem if they hoped to beat this boy. They would have to work together, isolate him from his allies, and gang up on him all at once. Jayadratha of Sindh decided now was the time to call on that special boon that Shiva had granted him back in the Book of the Forest. Remember, after he tried to kidnap Draupadi and got caught and humiliated by the Pandavas, he is too shamed to return home. Instead, Jayadratha had propitiated Shiva for the power to kill the Pandavas. But all Shiva could offer was the ability to slow them down for just a little bit, but not Arjun. So now Jayadratha decided it was time to call on Shiva and to keep the Pandavas at bay. So Jayadratha rode off to attack the Pandavas, holding them off at a distance, while Drona and Karna put the second part of their plan into action. Laying a sort of ambush on the boy, Ashvataman dueled with him, while Drona methodically shot and killed his horses and destroyed his chariot. At the same time, Karna shot out the boy's bow, Abhimanyu leapt off his crashed chariot and came flying down, sword and shield in hand. But Drona shattered his sword while Karna destroyed his shield. Disarmed and prickling with arrows, the boy landed on his feet. Without any weapons, he seized a chariot wheel and ran toward Drona with murder in his eyes. Sanjay said, With the wheel in his hands, raised above his head, for a moment he looked just like Krishna himself. In the midst of that gathering of kings, his might was without parallel. But it was only a moment because then the wheel too was blasted from his hands. Again and again, Drona, Karna, and Ashvataman fired arrows into the defenseless boy. But he wasn't done yet. Tottering, Abhimanyu picked up a fallen mace and lunged at his nearest tormentor. The boy smashed Ashvataman's chariot, killing his horse and driver. But Dushasan's son, simply called Dashasani, intervened with his own mace. The pair of second cousins traded blows, but by now, Abhimanyu was weak with blood loss and hampered by the thicket of arrows and darts sticking out of him. Exchanging blow for blow, both fighters were knocked to the ground. Tragically, it was Dalshasani who was the first to recover. And he brought his cudgel smashing down on Abhimanyu's head as the boy tottered to his feet. He reeled from the blow, then fell to the ground, dead. Sanjay said, My lord, so it was that one died at the hands of many. One warrior who had trampled our army now lay in the splendor of death, like a mighty elephant killed by hunters. 
Your soldiers stood in a circle where he fell. His face glowed like the full moon, his eyes hidden behind dark locks of hair. My lord, we celebrated as tears fell from the eyes of our enemies. Six of your fighters, Drona and Karna, chief among them, had cut this lone boy to the ground in what I consider a sinful way. Yet how beautiful the rich earth looked as it cradled that dead hero. Sanjay went on, The Pandavas looked at the broken figure of Abhimanyu, who had once been as bright as the sun and the moon, and they were struck down with sorrow. But to your side, my king, how sweet a sight was his corpse. Seeking to reassure his downcast supporters, Yudhishthira addressed his men. He said, Here is a hero who has left for paradise. He preferred death to retreat. But take heart, because with his loss we shall win this war and overcome our traitors. The bard also has something to say about this sad story. Our narrator says, So it was that in the ecstasy of battle, Abhimanyu fought and killed thousands of princely foes, and then passed on. Thousands of chariots and horses and elephants and men all fell before him, and although he died young, he is not to be mourned. What he did was holy, and when he died, he left for the paradise only found by the pure in heart, deed, and soul. Then Sanjay said, We had killed their champion, but we still felt the wounds where his arrows had struck us and we returned to our camp at the end of the day, soaked in blood. So immense was the slaughter that day, that it was as if city upon city had been slain by raiders, thick with broken chariots, dead horses and riders, clothed in fallen jewelry and fabrics, torn out tongues, teeth, bowels and eyeballs, the earth bore an appalling bounty. Then came dogs and jackals, crows, vultures and hyenas, all bristling with pleasure. A throng of ghosts added to the horrors. And still, men looked upon that supreme warrior, all his great and worthy decorations now stripped and ruined. Abhimanyu, Indra's equal, lie dead on the field of battle. Back at Yudhishthira's tent, the king of the Pandavas was stricken with sorrow and guilt. He lamented that he had sent his brother's young son, unprotected, into an ambush. He said, Abhimanyu is dead, so how can I look my brother in the eye? How will I face Supadra when she comes looking for her son? Should I lie to Krishna about what really happened to his cherished nephew? But it was I who caused this calamity. I wish I could lay down by his side on his funeral pyre, rather than face my brother, who trusted me to care for his son. But the price the Karvas will pay for this will be complete destruction. The Karvas will be swept away by the fury Arjun will have over the treacherous death of his son. That petty tyrant Duryodhana will see the annihilation of his friends before losing his own life. The Pandava must have been in pretty bad shape because the sage Vyasa, the author of our story, showed up at just this moment. Yudhishthira greeted his ancestor with due respect, and then complained to him, saying, Abhimanyu is dead. He was killed by a band of mighty Karva bowmen. I sent him forward to clear the way for the rest of us, and he charged ahead without concern for his life. But then the king of Sindh blocked the rest of us, while the boy was cruelly cut down in an ambush. The unfairness of it burns my heart with grief. I can find no peace of mind. Whether I win this war, gain immortality, or live among the gods, nothing will bring me joy again. A light has gone out in the world. I have seen the son of the son of Indra struck down before me. A child was killed before he could show his true greatness. Vyasa comforted his grandson, saying, My son, men like you do not shrink in the face of calamity. It is the natural course of things for a warrior to slay his foes and then to go on to dwell in paradise. Abhimanyu had fulfilled his life's purpose and achieved things beyond his years. Death is the end of all beings. Even the gods and asuras must eventually die. This seemed to snap him out of his funk somewhat, because Yudhishthira became philosophical. He asked the sage why death had to take the lives of young and old, good and bad. Vyasa replied with the story. Unfortunately, it wasn't a very good story. It is more complicated than it is interesting. Here's the gist of it. He began by telling about a king named Akampana who suffered the death of his son in battle. This king was heartbroken, so the sage Narada came by and told him a story. Narada's story was about Brahma at the beginning of time, and frankly, it just barely makes sense. To explain the nature of death, Narada said that Brahma first created the world, but then somehow got worried that the life he had created was burgeoning out of control. Brahma's anxiety turned to anger, and he flared up with fire and began to burn up the world and everything in it. The god Shiva prostrated himself before Brahma and begged him to stop his destruction. Brahma, after all, is the creator, not the destroyer. So Brahma relented somewhat, and out of his eyes and ears sprang a dark woman called Death. 
Brahma instructed this woman, his daughter, that her job was to take the life away from living creatures. The poor girl was very reluctant to take on the job. She cried and her tears fell like rain. Brahma promised her it would just be a job to do and she wouldn't have to worry about incurring bad karma for her actions. But still, Death was not happy with her new job. Instead of taking up her duties, she went to the mountains and spent eons in penance and meditation. Finally, Brahma reassured her that she would incur no sin by doing this duty and that Yama and disease would be there to help out. He took her tears and sprinkled them over the earth. They became the countless diseases that take men to their graves. Finally, death consented. She said, Father, if it is I who must do this, then may it never be done without me, so that I may be blameless. Let it be that the greed, malice, rage, envy, and hubris that reside in men's hearts be the cause of their destruction. Narada concluded his story, saying, Death felt love and anger, but she set them aside. Now she takes the breath from the living without passion. Death comes as the illness within us and our own base nature. So release your grief. Death visits everyone when their time is done. Thus it is for all living things. This strange story was enough to satisfy Akampana, and it also worked for Yudhishthira. Vyasa said, Now make firm your resolve, son of Pandu. Cast away your sorrow, don your armor, and go forth with your brothers to battle. This ends day 13 of the Great War. I guess 13 isn't a very lucky number in India either. Next time, we'll take a brief hiatus from all the fighting, as Arjun and his wife Subhadra react to the news of their son's death. Thanks for listening. <laughs>